Oh, is somebody on? Did somebody just join? I was just about to kick it off, seeing that it is one o'clock. Um, so welcome everyone to the 16th meeting of the New York State Climate Action Council meeting. Um, it's my pleasure to um, welcome you all here um, for this meeting. We've uh, chosen to hold today's meeting via webinar um, as a matter of safety, as well as, well as to enable broader participation across the state. Um, and I will hand it to Farah Anderson to walk us through the procedures for today's meeting before diving into the agenda. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, as always, to ensure that we have a smooth and productive meeting, um, we'll just briefly walk through the logistics and procedures for today um, to ensure that that's top of mind for the council members. Um, so there's a few key pieces. Uh, the first is to remain on mute if you're not speaking. Um, and use that mute button to unmute yourself um, as you are called upon, um, and then re-mute yourself when you are done with your comment or question. Uh, we will also monitor members to ensure that they're muted, but it's always helpful to uh, monitor that directly as well. We do encourage council members to join us on video if possible. Um, the camera button, I think you've all become familiar with uh, as you just showed during tech check, but it is displayed on the slide here. Um, to ask questions, we do ask that you use the raise your hand function, which is also displayed on the screen, and that would indicate that you'd like to speak. Um, and then lastly, if you have any questions or concerns that come up over the course of the meeting um, from a technical standpoint, feel free to direct them to the email address displayed here, nys.cac at cadmusgroup.com. And with that, I will pass back to you, Sarah. Thanks, Farah. Um, so now we'll turn to roll call to see which uh, members of the council are in attendance. Is Valerie Milanovic from NYSERDA available? I'm here, Sarah. Do the roll call? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Co chair Harris. Good afternoon. Hello, Co chair Sagos. Good afternoon, folks. Commissioner Ball. A good afternoon to you all. Donna DeCarlis. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm not sure if Commissioner Dominguez has had a chance to log on yet. I know she might be a few minutes late, but just in case. Okay. Gavin Donahue. I'm here. Thank you. Dennis Elsenbeck. Uh, here. CEO Falcone. Hi, everybody. On behalf of Empire State Development, Vince Bradashare. Here. Rose Harvey. We'll circle back. Christian. Good afternoon. Bob Howard. I'm here. Thank you. Peter Iwanowitz. Here. Thanks. CEO Quinones. Present. Commissioner Reardon? Here. Ann Reynolds? On behalf of Secretary Rosado, Keisha Santiago Martinez? Good afternoon, everyone. Raya Salter? Good afternoon, I am present. Paul Jackson? I am here. <laughs> Good afternoon. Commissioner Visnaskis. I am here. Uh, on behalf of Commissioner Zuck, Henry Sleetoff. Good afternoon. I'm here as well. Good afternoon. Um, I'll just give one more uh, shout to uh, Commissioner Dominguez in case she's had a chance. To, I know her intention is to join. Uh, she might not be here yet. And Rose Harvey. And Ann Rex. With that, council co chairs, I note the presence of a quorum for today's Climate Action Council meeting. Thank you, Val, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we get into our regular agenda and program for the afternoon, I, I did want to take a moment uh, to certainly acknowledge one of our colleagues. 
as many of you have already heard um, the news from this morning, uh, NIPA, NIPA's president and CEO, Gil Quinones, will be leaving the organization in November for a role in the private sector. So, in addition to being a fellow council member and my sort of board member, Gil has certainly been a strong partner to me and to so many of us in collaboratively advancing our state's clean energy agenda. So, I know I wanted to take a moment along with my co-chair to sincerely thank him for his service to the state. We are truly going to miss you, Gil, but we know you have so much to be proud of as you, as you head, uh, head into the private sector. Uh, Basil, would you like to add any thoughts? Uh, I would, <clears throat> um, Gil, uh, I'll second everything that my fellow co-chair uh, just, just mentioned, Doreen. Um, we will miss you. You've been a great friend uh, to all of us in the cabinet and the administration. Um, you've been a transformative leader of NIPA. I mean, a decade of incredible work with transmission, uh, modernizing your facilities, um, leading on green power, collaborating with uh, the private sector, with nonprofits, with other agencies. I mean, you've been a model leader of, of that organization. We're greatly gonna miss you. Uh, and of course, your reimagined canals system uh, project is is really something that I think we can all cheer as that is getting off the ground. So congratulations on this move. Um, I know that uh, former uh, Commissioner Martens and I both share the uh, the distinction of being um, certain that the the fish on the Salmon River um, won't miss you. Um, but uh, but we're grateful. So thank you, Gil. We'll miss you, man. Okay. Uh, Gil, did you Anyone have anything else? you you wanted yeah. to say? Um, thank you very much, um, Madam Chair and uh, Chair Sagos. You know, it's 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 not easy to uh, leave the power authority. I I love I love love the power authority and and its employees, and that includes the New York State Canals, and I love serving uh in in this great state of ours under almost all circumstances i would have stayed and served uh under the administration of governor hokal i believe she is the right person to lead us in this battle uh, uh of this climate crisis you know there 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 was a mayor in new york city uh by the name of mayor ed koch and he said that uh, public service is the most noble profession when done right. And uh, Governor Hochul has done it right in her entire uh, public career. Uh, I have in NIPA, we have done so many projects with her when she was Lieutenant Governor. Uh, I would boast, uh, maybe Doreen uh, will, will probably uh, beat us on this, but probably we have done the most number of engagement and projects with Lieutenant Governor, then Lieutenant Governor Hochul and now Governor Hochul uh, over the years. Uh, so it's uh, really with, with uh, mixed emotion for me to, to go on to this next phase. It's, it's a unique opportunity uh, that is good for my family and for myself at this stage of my career. Uh, I've been with NIPA for 14 years. So I've worked for four governors and uh, 10 years as a president and CEO. And it's, it's really the work of the employees, uh, including our union brothers and sisters who that made this place uh, special and that transform this place uh, for the better. And it's poised to do uh, many more things that will benefit the people of the state. What I am gratified about this uh, body, the Climate Action Council, is that the end in mind uh, is clear. And, and you are all, while we may have differences on how to get there, all of us in this Climate Action Council we know that we have a common destination and that we all have to get there together. So I will be watching uh, all of you from afar 
on how you will navigate from where we are today to that ultimate destination. But I'm confident with all of you and your skills and talents and your determination that you will get there. Now, our board of trustees um, was very, very smart. We, we have a great board of trustees and they had appointed uh, Justin Driscoll, our general counsel uh, and executive vice president to be the interim president uh, and CEO of NIPA, which means NIPA is not gonna miss a beat. And, and I just wanna pull him over here so that you can see his face and introduce him to you because in the next meetings of this council, uh, he will be participating on behalf of the New York Power Authority. Hey, Justin. Hello, everyone. Look forward to uh, working with you all. Great to be here. Gil has kept me posted on the great work of your group, and I look forward to being uh, a part of it as we go forward. So great to meet you all and uh, see you soon. Well, Madam Chair and, and, and uh, Chair Sagas, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to address uh, and to, to be inserted in the agenda today. Much love. Thank you all. Gil, thank you. Thank um, you. No, no cheering for the, uh, the Cubs, White Sox, or Bears, please. <laughs> That's going to be the toughest thing. I'm a huge New York Giants fan and New York Yankees fan, so I don't know whether they're going to kick me out uh, right off the bat. Uh, and also, I, I, uh, Chairman Sagos, if you could send me some DEC um, <laughs> Thermal underwear, uh, pro my, my Filipino blood will probably be challenged in Chicago this coming winter. <laughs> right. Will do. We'll give you uh, tips on bratwurst as well and old style beer. You'll be fine. Uh, keep in touch, Gil. Excellent. Um, okay. With that, uh, we'll go into the agenda. You all see it in front of you right here. Um, we'll take up the minutes and then we'll get into the integration analysis scenario results, as well as the initial draft scope and plan walk through and then touch on some next steps. Um, so let's uh, get right to the minutes. Next slide. Uh, is there any discussion of the minutes uh, from October 1st, 2021? Any questions? I see Dennis has uh, Dennis, his hand your hand. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Basil. Yeah, just on uh, on the minutes on page fourteen, uh, we just we were discussing uh, long duration storage on either the supply side or the demand side. Um, Carl, uh, it, at least it's picked up here that it, it that refers to both sides of the meter. Uh, the supply side and the demand side refer to opposite end. So the supply side feeds the transmission distribution system. Uh, it's the demand side that feeds the residential, commercial, industrial. So it's not really before and after the meter. It's uh, on either end of the electric system. I uh, just wanted to make sure that was clear. And uh, also on uh, page 15, uh, where we talk about uh, proactive approach to transmission and distribution planning, uh, suggesting that past regulatory frameworks created generational issues, although I do believe we created generational issues, that should really say generation issues. Um, at what NISO refers to is the creation of generation pockets, and that means uh, disconnected uh, generation sources that the current PSC order uh, is looking at uh, making sure we're connecting to meet the CLCPA goals. And as Gil has mentioned um, on numerous occasions, uh, we really have to concern ourselves with resiliency and reliability. And, and so it's really kind of like don't create problems because of disconnected generation. Thanks, Basil. Thank you, Dennis. Good questions, points. Um, anyone else? I don't see anyone other. Any other hands on the list here? Okay. Um, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Can I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Okay. The motion carries. Thank you all. Uh, now over to Doreen for the integration analysis. Thank you. 
Thank you. And uh, here we are at the next slide. So uh, the primary agenda topic for today is the integration analysis. Um, there will be a subsequent topic uh, covered, but this is obviously a, a very significant topic in, in the focus, of course, of our meeting. So at our last several meetings, Carl Moss, um, my colleague from NYSERDA, presented um, some initial outputs from test runs of the integration analysis, as well as various scenarios designed based on input from the council members. So today we will hear again from Carl, where he'll present some of the full scenario results and namely the cost and benefit information for some of those scenarios. I know I'm not the only one that has been anxiously awaiting the full results from the integration analysis. Uh, certainly, as a reminder, the integration analysis itself is grounded in the CLCPA statute, which directs us as a council to not only estimate the emissions reductions associated with measures which will achieve the Climate Act goals, but also to evaluate the costs and benefits of those measures. So, in some ways, it feels like costs and benefits are the final piece of the puzzle that we are collectively working to solve. However, in many ways, I think as we look forward, the challenging work of the council is just getting started, not only as we review these results collectively, but also as we turn to our draft scoping plan and the 2022 activities. So, while we will see results based on a few key scenarios, please keep in mind that these scenarios have been designed to bound the analysis and certainly not to set up an either or situation where we pick our favorite scenario. Um, this information is essentially yet another input and will provide an important point of reference as we head into 2022. And I fully expect that over the next year, once the draft scoping plan is issued, we will continue to discuss and debate the various strategies, challenges, and trade-offs that advance us to our goals. So, with this preamble, I will turn the presentation over to Carl Moss and the team leading this work. I do have to say this team has advanced this analysis tirelessly over the past months. And I know I speak for Commissioner Sagos when I say that we are truly thankful, not only for their expertise, but the insights you're about to glean as well. So, thank you to the team and over to you, Carl. Great, thanks, Dorian, and it's great to see you all again. Um, it was great that we could spend some time meeting previously, and at least we can still gather in, in the forum and to walk through the slides. We've got another large deck today. Uh, I think all told, it's around 100. We're going to try to get through most of it. Um, so as a result, um, we are planning to take a break. Um, I'll try to time it either before the sensitivities or before the deep dive into the air quality. Um, so just to give you all um, that positive note, you won't have to sit there um, for the full two hours. Um, and also just to make clear, and then maybe to just reiterate the thanks that, that Doreen gave, I sometimes appear to be an army of one in my room alone, um, but there are dozens of folks who have been working tirelessly on this. Um, we have our lead consultants from E3, um, who've done an incredible job. I'm actually, partly to break up the uh, sessions, I'm gonna ask one of their analysts speak in some to some of the details of the electricity system modeling. We did get some questions from, from the council members on the kind of grid modeling and load flexibility and the kind of this firm uh, resource issue. So we're gonna unpack that a bit more um, and I'll ask Kevin to uh, join the stage virtually um, when we get to that sensitivity section. Um, obviously we've got staff from, from across multiple agencies who've been working on this as well. Um, you know, a specific uh, shout out to the folks who've been working on the air quality work. I think it's really uh, best in nation work. We're doing, you know, we, we did a, we looked far and wide across other scoping plans and other similar studies and, um, and we set the bar of trying to, to uh, more comprehensively look at health than, than anyone has in the past. And I think we, we have succeeded and that's really, you know, a testament to the leadership, not just in NYSERDA, but DOH and, and uh, DEC um, and the staff and those teams who have helped. Um, and I hadn't planned actually the same thing, but uh, about Gil, but um, I'll take the opportunity again, also to thank you, Gil, for being such a great colleague. I've, I've been working for the state um, 
for 15 years. So we've, we've seen the arc of the energy system um, over that time through different lenses, but you know, from your leadership of the original energy highway to the grid uh, mod work that we've collaborated on to this most recent power grid study, um, I think we've, we've really not only helped to keep the, the system running smoothly and well, but we've, we've begun to be uh, nation leading in the way that we're looking at both a smart grid and a clean grid. Um, so, so thank you, Gil, for, for all that great work um, and for the support you've given me over these years. Uh, okay, so with that, um, I'll run through table of contents. Um, so I do partly in response to the council members, to, to you all, um, some of you really wanted to take a deeper dive into some of the work that I, I presented last time. Um, we didn't get to unpack some of the specifics around buildings and transport, which you know are the two largest sources of emissions. Um, so I'll spend a little bit of time just walking you through, through that again. Um, and then when we get through the recap, I'll pause and we can open up the floor for any questions or thoughts um, more backward looking, thinking about all the scenario work that I shared on the first and then some of this recap. Um, and then we'll dig into the new work, which is the uh, uh, benefits cost analysis. Um, and after that, um, as I promised, uh, probably a couple months ago, we also did sensitivities. There are sensitivities that are embedded in the benefits and costs. We've looked at uh, variation across uh, fossil fuel price forecasts, which are highly uncertain over 30 years. We looked at technology cost and innovation. Um, we looked at some of the uncertainty around some of the benefits side. Um, we also, there were specific sensitivities that um, you all agreed that we should un unpack um, with the electric system. Given that it is the backbone of our system now, we, we need the grid to do anything today, and it will increasingly, as I showed last time, you know, on the order of getting to be 75% of our final energy, um, it will be the system that we need and that we need to grow. So it is important to spend some extra time there. Um, as I mentioned, we've um, done some really great work and novel work in the air quality field, so I'm going to spend a, a, a few slides um, to, to unpack that for you all. Uh, I did want to give a brief update on some of the carbon pricing um, thoughts we've been having. Um, they're still nascent, but I, I didn't want to leave that off of the agenda. Um, and then we'll see um, how the overall discussion unfolds. So next slide, please. Um, so as a reminder, I'll probably have this on each time I give a talk going forward um, where you can find our work. Um, you know, we are endeavoring to respond to requests of maximizing transparency. Um, and so on the climate website, we have our resources page. We've already posted the, the uh, detailed slide deck from last time. We've got our key driver spreadsheets that are up there. We're going to be adding new cases um, as we extract them from the workbooks and can put them up on the website. This presentation will also be put up there. Um, and so it, it's a great place to look. We're also going to be linking to some supplemental studies so um, there was a slide I probably shared last summer or this previous summer that talked about the, the wealth of studies that were really integrating um, from uh, methane mitigation to HFC mitigation, some resource potential around bioenergy. Um, so we're going to be adding some of those more deep dives as, as links. Um, many of them may live on NYSERDA's website, but we'll link it all here so you've got one-stop shopping on our uh, resources page. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and again, so just to recap where we are and frame up what I'm going to focus on today, um, we spoke about the reference case and our AP advisory recommendations previously. Um, last time and previous time we discussed um, in some great detail and got some great feedback from you on our scenarios. Um, we've teed up three additional scenarios we're calling two, three, four. Um, what I highlighted last time was that there's a, some pretty incredible level of commonality at, as a base across all of them from our zero electric, um, zero emission grid to our enhanced and expanded transit to deep efficiency and rapid electrification. We have to go further and wider around methane mitigation given our uh, new accounting. I think what we showed last time from the advisory panel work um, was in, in, in 2050, there was still a large amount of methane that was still in the system. Um, so we've, we've, we've had to go deeper there um, and then in terms of system operability, if we're going to be shifting to 75% of final energy into the grid, it needs to be a flexible, smart system. Um, 
And so that's, that's um, included in, in all scenarios um, and their different levels, some of the uh, differentiating factor between two and three. For the day today, I'm gonna to focus on scenario two and three. So just to recap, that's the uh, strategic use of low carbon fuels. Um, again, it's a system that's predominantly based on a grid that is wind, water, um, and sunshine. Um, it, is, it is a heavily electrified system. It has strategic use of bioenergy, mostly derived from biogenic waste and ag residues, forest residues, a very limited amount of purpose-grown uh, bioenergy, um, as well as green hydrogen. Um, juxtaposed against that, but there really are sister scenarios, just again, because as I showed you last time, there's a lot in common between them. Um, but differentiating factors there is we're really looking to limit, in some cases, have no combustion. So no bioenergy combustion, no hydrogen combustion, switching to fuel cells where we might need to use hydrogen for long duration storage um, you know, in lieu of new technologies that may come. Um, and as a response, we've had to accelerate our electrification and our energy efficiency. So we'll see how those play out, both in terms of differential health impacts, different cost structures. Um, the scenario four, which goes beyond 85%, I'm gonna save that for next time. Um, and we're gonna, just because of the, the bulk of this, this overall work, we're really gonna focus in on looking at two and three this time. Um, we won't also hit every sensitivity, but I did wanna front load in the time we have together the electric system sensitivities, because in my mind, those are the most critical. Uh, next slide, please. And it's not advancing on my end. Is that my camera or is it just on a delay? Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is a scorecard that you should be familiar with a bit at this point. Um, so it's trying to give you a qualitative sense and a guide um, to unpack the very detailed sets of uh, research that have done and the advisory panel recommendations that feed into the core drivers of our scenarios. Um, so you'll see a lot of commonality, as I've mentioned. Um, we've got deep efficiency, transit, zero emission vehicles, and um, the uh, clean electric grid is the base. We've gone a little higher. We've turned up the dial a little bit more for ZEVs and for building electrification in scenario three. One of the key differentiating factors is the low carbon fuel use. Um, in terms of ag and waste, we've had to push those envelopes strongly forward in both. Um, in terms of uh, carbon capture and land use, it's, it's um, clearly ambitious in both. We've gone a little bit further in scenario three, and both have had to rely on to fill that gap of our, our, our sequestration have to rely on what are still prototypical net emission, uh, uh, negative emission technologies. And so that's what the scenario four will pressure test and uh, give us some idea of options around. Next slide. So a little bit of a deeper dive. Um, we didn't get to these slides last time, but they were in, in the deck. Um, so what's hopefully coming in a minute um, is the first look at scenario two around buildings. And I can, I guess, start speaking to it until it lands. Um, so maybe just to orient you to what you will see, um, the, the graphs on the right give you a sense of how the final energy in this sector evolves. It's a highly electrified system in the long run. It's one dominated by gas and electric now. Um, and so gas has, sees a, a significant um, trend downward. Um, in terms of where the overall emissions, that's what that second graph shows you. Space heating dominates what our emission sources, and obviously we have to um, bring those down drastically over time. So I'll do this for both buildings and for transportation and for each scenario. Um, I also have some slides that I'll try to spend a little extra time on, which show the physical stock rollover in the system. I think it's important for us to get a physical sense of the level of ambition, um, and it's true across both scenarios. Um, and as we think about, you know, where in the scoping plan we need to look at uncertainties and risk and what are the, what are the ways in which consumer adoption will need to change radically, what types of policies do we need to drive? I think it's important to get a sense of the actual physical system and how it changes. But just some of the highlights here, um, which will show up in the graphs, you know, we're showing, you know, um, over 75% sales share of electrified heat by just, you know, approaching 2030 with 100% sales by 2035. Um, so that's a dramatic uptick um, from where we will be, uh, where we are today. Um, we're talking about millions of vehicle, uh, sorry, millions of heat pumps that will be in our system. Um, we're looking at 
for the other other end uses, seeing 100% of sales um, for cooking and for clothes drying by 2035 in this scenario. And then for the district heating system, um, which is not a large percent of the overall footprint, but it serves some very specific buildings in a very congested part of the state. Um, we are looking at for one for the core scenario, looking at hydrogen as as a source of heat. But there might be other technologies that that could come to the fore. Um, and then uh, building shell improvements are dramatic. You know, we've pressure tested to what degree we can see deep energy retrofits as opposed to um, what would be more aggressive than our current standard efficiency, but, but not the kind of deep retrofits. And so we have a blend of those. Um, next slide. So you'll see that scenario three is fairly similar. The kind of main pivot there um, is that we get a little more aggressive on our sales share and then we layer on top of it early re retirement. So we go up to 80% of sales share by around 2030, but then 10, in addition to that, we see we, we have to turn off the dial and see 10% early adoption in order to get at that stock uh, rollover in order to, to hit our goals when we have um, less bioenergy in, in, in the mix. Um, so that's, again, one of the key things that we'll, we'll see on the graph. Next slide. So this is the stock rollover, um, and this will show you for the residential space. So on the left, just to orient you, that's space heating, and what we stacked up here are the actual appliances. Um, and you'll see that the uh, yellow orange are natural gas appliances, both efficient and kind of standard practice. Um, and you'll see that in that top left quadrant, that's the sales share. Um, and so we see a very steep slope between 2025 and 2030 as we really ramp up. Um, and see a much higher level of penetration of our air source heat pumps um, and, and ground source heat pumps. Um, you know, we've done the, the kind of research of potential. We, we do think air source heat pumps will be the dominant source, but that, that line is one scenario and uh, just one view. Um, we do think there's a huge benefit to ground source heat pumps, especially further north, uh, where you can see much higher efficiency during uh, cold operations. In our scenario two, we also have backup fuel with our air source heat pumps. That helps us to really manage our, our grid, um, and it helps to reduce uh, both the technical challenges of building out the grid, which you know aren't specifically uh, quantified here, but are certainly an important part of what the scoping plan has to think through, as well as some of the costs of the grid expansion. Um, the bottom left quadrant is the actual stock. And so what you'll see is even with such aggressive sales share, our stock rollover is slow. It's, it's the time it takes to have a heating system turnover. Um, and so that's why we have to be so aggressive so quickly, because we have to start getting these clean systems into buildings. Um, and that's where we see, you know, by 2030, as I summarized last time, in this scenario, it's one and a half million homes. In the next scenario, it's around two million homes. You know, but so out of, out of our eight million households, um, you know, that's, that's the first important step, but it's, it's just one step along the way to a, a, a decarbonized system. On the right, we show energy efficiency, um, where we see, you know, massive upgrades um, in the system over time with a, a number of where we think technically feasible deep shell upgrades um, and what we call uh, basic shell, but really that's not run of the mill. That's uh, taking buildings that are existing, that are old, you know, don't have the, the, the kind of comfort levels that, that we need, don't have the efficiency levels that we need, tightening them up, um, both as a way to give um, our residents a better quality of, of life in their homes and help us to manage our grid over time. Next slide. And so for scenario three, I'll just speak in this quickly. You can hopefully see why they are sister scenarios. It's, it's deep, deep electrification. What you see in the early years on that top left quadrant is that we have an even more aggressive slope. Um, and the only way you can kind of see that type of rate of change is if you go after early retirement. And so that's where you see that, that bump out, which allows us to turn up the dial faster. Next slide, please. So I'm not gonna dwell on these, um, but I just wanted to make sure you all are aware in the original deck that we sent out, we do have the very specific assumptions, the very specific drivers that came out of, again, looking at potential studies for New York that we've done over decades, looking at what's the building stock and vehicle stock, working with our advisory panels, working with outside experts from national labs and from academia to develop these key drivers of what and build it into the physical system of our stock rollover. Uh, next slide, please. 
And so we also characterize, again, kind of low, the low carbon fuels, how they're, they're differentiated. Um, as, I, as I explained, um, you know, we look for uh, district heating systems that most likely need to be hydrogen in both cases. Um, when we look at biomass feedstocks, as I mentioned at the, at the opening, we've got in-state resources plus um, a small share of what we see would be kind of population-based sustainable feedstocks from our region. Um, but again, as I showed in detail last time, even in this scenario, it's a very small slice of the energy system. Um, what we looked in scenario three was not utilizing any of that. Um, so just wanted to be clear on some of those differentiating factors. Next slide. So shifting gears into the transportation system, same orientation as last time, upper right quadrant. That's our final energy. Um, we see that we become a highly electrified transportation system, but a more diverse system given the diversity of the types of vehicles we have on road, off road. Um, and we also see hydrogen playing a larger role in this final energy mix um, in the future. Again, we have some significantly, uh, some significant challenge in uh, fully electrifying, whether it be for the potentially long haul freight, looking at rail, looking at um, air travel, um, but we're, we're significantly obviously turning the dial in, in, in a reduction, both in terms of overall efficiency because of the embedded efficiency of electrification and switching to that fuel. You will see in scenario two in that right quadrant, we do have bioenergy, so significant amount that's helping to displace jet fuel. Um, in the early years, we are displacing some of our diesel with um, bioenergy as, as a way to help manage the kind of near-term carbon footprint of the system. That uh, fuel comes at a cost, which I'll, I'll, I'll be showing uh, later. Um, it did have a significant impact on the overall uh, net, net system cost. Um, and you'll see in this case in the lower right quadrant where are the emissions that still persist because we have a carbon footprint with every molecule that we burn, whether it's bio or fossil, you'll still see that aviation, that bright green, still um, has a meaningful footprint. Um, and that's one that we hope through innovation and through federal policy we'll be able to address. Um, but it's one of those lingering sources along with methane um, from our ag uh, system um, and from our, our waste system that will more likely than not be something that we have to manage in the future. Um, so turning back to some of the key metrics, uh, you know, we see um, in this scenario significant sales share of EVs in, um, in 2030 going up to 100% in 2045. That's consistent with the law in New York. And um, for, for, for the heavy duty, we also see a significant percent of sales share, which, which I can show on the graph. That's a little more uncertain exactly when that will land in terms of kind of seeing 100% zero emission. Um, but we see that there will be a blend of those Zs. It will be battery electric, which is the BEV, as well as fuel cell vehicles. Um, you know, we see a, a substantial reduction on the order of 6% um, of vehicle miles of travel in both the scenario two and three. It may not sound like a lot, but that is an incredible level of ambition. I know when I started my career in the early years, um, that was the type of level of ambition we were, asked, we were first aspiring to over a decade ago, and we've been challenged to kind of realize that level of ambition over this last decade. Um, so it, it definitely calls for a high level of activity in terms of smart growth, in terms of mixed use of, uh, of development, obviously embedding that in the local communities, so it's, it's community driven. Um, next slide, please. So looking at the stock rollover, um, what we'll see is kind of similar ski slopes um, when we look at the uh, level of the sales share that we're going to, oh, that comes next. So scenario three, I got ahead of myself. So key differentiating factor here is that we are um, not substituting for bioenergy. We're seeing higher levels of, a, of a electrification um, in order to make up for those emissions. Um, and we're seeing that we have to, therefore, also bend the curve a little bit faster on the heavy duty and medium duty. Um, so those are some of the differentiating factors there. When we're not substituting for marginally lower carbon fuels, we need to electrify faster, um, and we have to lean into that medium and heavy duty fleet a little bit faster. Um, so that's what we'll see in the next slide. So the next slide gives us our stock turnover um, for uh, the scenario two. So this is that ski slope in the upper left quadrant where we have to dramatically increase our sales share. You know, we're in uh, single digits now. Um, it's been actually really impressive to see the level of, uh, of adoption picking up um, in this past year or two. Um, and what we need to do is just further accelerate that. Um, and so by, you know, again, by the 
2035 we're at zero emission, you know, there will be more likely than not some areas where hydrogen fuel cells will be a, a component for a certain part of even our light duty fleet, which are the cars and uh, light duty trucks. But we think it's going to be a, a predominantly battery electric story. Um, and what you can see on the right for the medium heavy duty, it's a much more diverse system. Um, as I mentioned, kind of a, a number of uh, different vehicle types and end uses. We see a much larger role for hydrogen in, in this scenario to kind of give us all the functionality that we think we're going to need in, in the long run. Next slide. So what you see in the in the stock roll over here is a more, more aggressive um, slope, and we aren't seeing any hydrogen in the light duty vehicles, um, and we're seeing more electrification for the medium and heavy duty um, and a more aggressive slope on that uptake. So that is the story for the stock rollover within transportation. We'll just look at the next two slides in kind of quick succession. These are those baseball cards with the basic stats for each of these scenarios around transportation. Um, I won't read through them you, for you, but just want to make sure that you know they're there and we'll have spreadsheets that go even deeper. Uh, and then the, the next slide um, gives you a sense again of some of the key differentiating factors you know, around low carbon fuels, again, we don't have any biomass going to, to fuels in our scenario three. We do have a displacement with renewable diesel at a substantial rate, um, especially in the early years to see 75% renewable diesel by 2030. Um, and for aviation, you know, it's we're calling medium, which is still a, a challenge level of aggressive transformation. We have uh, a, a renewable aviation uh, fuel um, for, for, for the aviation plus substantial efficiency. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there. Um, it probably was once again felt a bit like a fire hose, um, but I, I did wanna try to go a little bit deeper for you in some of those key sectors and see if maybe there were any lingering questions. Hopefully that responds to some of the questions that I received along the way, which was, can we unpack that a little bit more um, but I'll pause here and see if folks have any feedback, any points of discussion, or any questions. And Carl, I can handle the hands for you if you'd like. Oh, please, I thank you. Bob, um, I see Bob Howarth has his hand, and then I see Dennis and Donna. Thank you, and Gavin. Gavin. And, and, and thank you, Carl. I was. Uh, there's a lot of information you packed in there very quickly. I appreciate it. So I've got one, uh, well, th well, two things. I, I noticed uh, that you're putting more of an emphasis on the air source heat pumps than the ground source heat pumps. And you mentioned that the green, the ground source heat pumps may have a better, a bigger role uh, upstate here where it's cold. And I get that. Uh, but I and others raised the issue earlier that, uh, you know, even though the ground source heat pumps are, uh, more expensive initially in terms of individual residences or individual buildings that they might have cost savings over the entire electric system by reducing mm -hmm. peak winter loads. And so I'd, I'd like to, uh, maybe you've looked at that explicitly, but I'd like to make uh, sure that we push as hard as we can to, to take that into consideration. So that that's one point. My other uh, is I, I see in your, uh, your summaries that with these, uh, Scenarios two and three that the building sector is now getting closer to the 40% reduction that the CLCPA calls for. I think it was 36 and 37% was the figure, but transportation is still down there around 27% or so. And and uh, I mean that just is low compared to, to the 40% by 2030 that the CLCPA demands. So I'm wondering what more we can do to to push that sector even harder. Thank you. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, great, great questions, Bob. And it's a good re reminder. I did not list our full suite of sensitivities. Um, so we do plan to present next time on that air source, uh, ground source trade off so we can begin to understand if we can unlock the potential for ground source, whether it be uh, downstate on, on, on Long Island, if it could be potentially more community based ground source loops. Um, we, we definitely agree, you know, programmatically, I think that's the state agrees. We're putting resources into those ideas and unlocking those markets. Um, and we absolutely want to understand what's the potential benefit there. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. Um, in terms of the kind of level of, of, of aggressiveness across these uh, scenarios, we're definitely feeling like we're pushing hard on each of the levers. Um, and 
partly why transportation takes more time. It's because of where they are today, um, which is we've seen across transportation an actual increase since 1990 that's unmatched in any other sector. You know, our grid has gotten much cleaner since 1990. Our buildings have actually gotten better over time. Transportation has gotten more efficient, but we've just been driving more and we've been driving bigger, right? Um, and so there's a, there's a higher mountain to climb uh, for transportation. And we just think that when you look at the kind of uh, risks and opportunity space, we do think transportation is in, in any scenario is going to have to lag some of the others. And so the others are gonna have to pick up the slack. So we are hitting 40% economy wide. We are not um, compromising on that level of, of ambition. Um, you know, we, we, we think that, you know, all the work out of the IPCC says that, you know, there is no way that we can achieve our goals if we don't go for that level of ambition. So we are realizing that in our scenario and what we've, you know, through this family, we've, we've looked at where we think we can push hard and everyone's getting pushed hard, um, but have to, we have to acknowledge where they're starting from today. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of, I think, how the kind of uh, trade-offs have gone. We kind of took all the input from the roadmaps and from the advisory panels and in that integration looked at where we can try to push um, without being unrealistic or un, un, unreasonable. Okay, thank, thank you, that's very helpful. And I, I look forward to hearing more about the ground source versus uh, air source pumps. Thank you. Great. Dennis so, Sarah, did you say Dennis? Yeah, thank you. Yep. As always, thank you. Um, every time you speak, I, I kind of like, I, it's almost, way, I wish we could just spend hours just talking back and forth. It's just, uh, I, it's exciting. And here's why, you know, on the building side, you know, we, when we, whenever we talk about millions of heat pumps, and I think you even said the last meeting, one to 2 million heat pumps over an extended period of time. And then you're looking at the scenarios, a hundred percent appliance, electrification of appliances. So whenever I, I'm, and this is, I think you and I spoke of this, or maybe we spoke it in general about, uh, for me, this, this equates to advanced manufacturing. And part of the benefit is not to look at this from the point of view of implementation or construction alone or, or, some, or sales alone, but uh, leveraging this as a uh, supply stream to attract an industry to, uh, to New York and to be part of it, if, if it's going to be part of ratepayer taxpayer input, uh, with special emphasis on our Rust Belt communities, uh, advanced manufacturing, extremely clean. So I don't know how you're looking at that in, the, in, the, in that context. And then just um, early retirements, every time I hear early retirements, I, I hear higher costs because of quicker, uh, because we're not fully depreciating uh, systems, I'm sure you're already thinking about that. And then on transportation, I just want to make sure when we mention uh, medium and heavy duty, uh, that includes off-road construction, uh, agricultural machinery. Um, and I, I'm, you're bobbing your head up, so I'm sure you're you have already considered that. Yeah. So thanks, Carl. Yeah. No, that yeah, that's great. Um, those are all great, great points, Dennis. Um, yeah, so on that advanced manufacturing, I think um, we're going to definitely want your input next month. Um, so that that concept is certainly one we want to test as part of our just transition. So as we look at the job opportunities in the state with this level of investment, which I'll be sharing in just a few slides, you know, that's going to be driving the potential for hundreds of thousands of jobs. And so we want to test, though, is what if we couple that transformation of our infrastructure with programs that try to look at new uh, new manufacturing in state and new opportunities in state. And so we want to pressure test with a scenario is what if we can draw some of that supply chain in state in that in those new opportunity space that, that you highlight. So we are going to look at that and turn over that stone as part of our just transition work and would love to get your feedback, you know, once we share it in terms of kind of are we looking at it through, through the right lens. Um, so that's great. Um, and then, yeah, so the higher cost, this is the day of cost. So um, I will be able to unpack that a bit. Um, and keep in mind, it's, it's, in, it's a 10%. So, you know, it wasn't a huge percentage of, you know, our um, available stock that we're looking to kind of accelerate. Um, and so we were very interested to see, you know, that trade-off between 
more expensive fuels versus accelerating that transition. Um, and it's not just the cost that you're absolutely right. You need to pay the overall system, right? If you're gonna truncate the life, you're paying more because over the full 30 years, you're having to have more equipment in the ground. You're also, when you accelerate that, you have a larger grid. So those are the interesting cost trade-offs that, that, that we are gonna highlight today. Um, so thanks for that. Sorry, who was next, was it Gavin? Um, I think we had Donna DeCarolis next. Donna, okay. Hi, Carl, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, just a few questions about some of the assumptions, Carl. Um, mm -hmm. And one is around um, in the building sector where you talked about, I think it was on both slides, but rapid adoption of electrified technologies. Um, and I was curious if there was any analysis that sort of um, segmented that, say for um, you know, colder climates, um, would oil conversions be prioritized, for example? You know, was there any kind of, um, you know, segmentation of that uh, to take into mm -hmm. account some of the areas, the regions that might be harder um, to electrify right. uh, and maybe mm -hmm. would have a energy burden impact? And I, I have a couple others, so why don't I keep going? There's just a couple. Sure, please. Um, yep. That's great. Thank you. And then I wondered if you could speak to, um, and, and you touched on it already, but the um, energy efficiency and the building shells, can you speak a little bit more to uh, the kinds of um, uh, efficiency reductions each of those two would, in, would result in, or maybe that's gonna be later. Um, and then I also just wondered, this is more of a, maybe you could just throw it in um, at the end somewhere. Could you put a glossary of terms in somewhere? Some of these technologies, I, I wasn't quite sure what they were. So, um, the one where you showed uh, key technology adoptions in buildings, um, things like efficient natural gas, uh, efficient distillate, if, if there could just be a glossary for me, it would be really helpful. Um, yeah, so yeah, absolutely. So um, I, one more? I forgot one last one, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go the ahead. last one was for the, um, the, the 1.5 million to $2 million uh, or 2 million um, uh, heat pumps that were going to be adopted in that range. Can you give me a rough idea of the useful life of the appliances that you're that you're presuming? And that's sure, that's sure, right. yeah. Thank um, you. So some of those assumptions I think will would probably be best framed as a follow up. Um, so what we'll do is we'll we'll extract you know, like our key definitions of what basic efficiency means and what the deep energy retrofit means. It's it's in the slides, but it's I get it. It's a hundred slides. So we'll, we'll, we'll pull it out for you and kind of put it together for, for you in a clear table. So let, let me do a fast follow up there. Um, and then in terms of kind of the geographic granularity, so we do look at the different climate zones. We do look at the different ISO zones and kind of layer on what are the building needs um, across those different zones? What are the, what's the grid congestion across each of those, those zones? Um, and so it's partly why when I mentioned ground source heat pumps, you know, we see that that technology for the much, you know, harsher winters, um, it, um, they're able to operate more, both more efficiently and more cost effectively. In our scenario too, we do look at, at backup heat um, and we think that that's predominantly is going to be needed in the colder northern climates. Um, you know, we already can see today that you can have an air source heat pump that can operate without any backup heat pretty cost effectively for certain segments downstate, especially when it's going against oil. Um, and so, you know, we, we do think there's gonna be strategic use if there's a scenario to view um, for, for that kind of backup heat. Um, given the level of transformation we're talking about, we have to go after all fuels, um, but certainly what we're seeing in the early market adoption, um, we are seeing adoption against the, the uh, more expensive fuels. And so we are seeing propane and oil, which on a, as you will know, on a per MMBTU basis are significantly more expensive. Um, notwithstanding this winter, which is going to be a, a hard one. Um, but, um, you know, looking at the long view of the differential prices, um, absolutely, we think that the kind of, that the, that the liquid fuels are more expensive and those will be the earlier markets. Uh, so, so certainly in terms of fuel type and geography, there is granularity there. Um, you know, this type of a long-term 30-year economy-wide model, though, it doesn't substitute for a much more granular roadmap. And so we are working on a buildings roadmap, building from the carbon neutral building roadmap. That was the kind of the long view at the 2050. We're doing a more detailed look in, into 2030 to really dig into our building stock at a level of granularity that this type of economy-wide tool can't do. 
Um, so we, you know, we ask this, this integration work to do everything, um, and therefore it can't do anything in, in a lot of detail. Um, so that's why we have to have complementary tools. Um, so let's see, did I hit? Oh, and then glossary of terms. So absolutely. Um, so um, certainly for the, the summary chapter in the scoping plan and then the, the deep appendix that will be our integration analysis, we're going to define all terms. Um, but that's a great note that, you know, why don't we take that back and we'll gin up a slide um, that will have kind of some, some key terms. Um, maybe realizing that that was a need, what I've done for the cost analysis, I do have a glossary slide. Um, so at least we can define some of the uh, uh, terms of art that I'll, I'll be using for the different pieces of cost. Um, but here you that, that that would be useful across each of the parts of our our work. So we we can definitely do that. And my last one was just on the stock turnover. What what are you assuming for say mm -hmm. yeah the average life say of a piece? Yeah, of yeah. So I have to get back to you on the specifics. It's either fifteen or 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 twenty year life um, for the kind of uh, typical furnace. So it's it's that order of magnitude, um, but certainly I, I can I can follow up, and I think it depends a bit if it's commercial versus residential. They have different lives. It's kind of different type of equipment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kevin Donahue. Hey, Carl. Thanks. Thanks for all this information. Yeah. I have a question, yeah. um, and I think this gets the reference case analysis and what goes into the reference case, but maybe it does. Maybe you can clarify for me. Um, the power sector power plant owners have paid into the Reggie program for, I'm going to say, 12 to 15 years. You know, back of the envelope estimate is somewhere between $1.5 billion and $2 billion. And a lot of money has gone to various programs in the transportation sector and in the clean building sector as part of the Reggie program. How is that accounted for? in the changes you presented earlier today as it relates to building and to a lesser extent, the transportation sector. Um, is that factored into this analysis or is this above and beyond? Yeah. No, yeah, great, great, great question on, on the reference case. So, you know, Reggie is a critical funding source along with our, our system benefit charges um, that we do in, in invest um, both to decarbonize, but to get other goals as well, right? To drive economic development, to realize our quality, to realize customer savings. Um, and so that, you know, ways that that manifests in the reference case, part of that funding goes to fund the uh, new efficiency in New York program. So that's a utility based program, but it's also programs that that I sort of run. Um, so that's not a direct mapping necessarily to a, a, a Reggie dollar, but that's an example of where the building transformation and the market uh, transformation is built into the reference case. So that's one example of, of new efficiency in New York. Our the level of ambition of the EV um, uh, EV adoption with our current programs is embedded in the reference case. Um, so both so not only is the electric grid transformation that's already in policy, but also those programs for building efficiency and for uh, vehicle electrification are built into the reference case. So again, just remind us the general principle of the reference case. Um, is to not only look at business as usual, but then layer on top of it all fully approved policies. Okay, and then just one other question um, about buildings and heating systems and gasoline cars. And there's gonna be a lot of uh, things that need to change and consumers need to have incentives to change that. The incentives, um, are they currently, does the state believe that the models that are in place are going to be adequate enough to make those consumer changes, or are we going to need a whole new suite of additional regulations and laws to make that change that we talked about in the scenario you laid out this morning workable? Yeah, so I guess I turned the question partly back to the council. I mean, I think that's what this deliberative body needs to discuss and, 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 and debate is how are we going to do this and what structures do we have in place? Can we expand those existing structures? Can we think about new opportunities? Our advisory panel certainly said kind of, I think, a, a wealth of knowledge and information, and it's up to the scoping plan to fully lay out, you know, what are going to be those new levers that we may need to pull, or what are existing levers that we just have to pour more, more time into and, and more resources into.
Okay, so thanks for the question. Um, who was next? I'm seeing we got Rory, Rory Christian, but I'm, yeah, yep. great. Hi, Carl. It's a great presentation. Um, I'm hoping you can go back a few slides. Uh, mm -hmm. I was looking at my notes and I, I don't know if I captured something appropriately, but at one point you mentioned building shell improvements. And I'm hoping by looking at the slide again, I can save you some time and explanation. Um, I took away from that it was building shell improvements related to code changes that would change new construction. And I want to make sure mm -hmm. I yeah. interpreted that correctly. Yeah, let me clarify. Yeah, great question. So, no, this is basic, what we call basic building shell, which is build, bringing existing buildings up to code um, and not past code, but as code evolves. So, this is not just the, our our new construction is really a small percent of the, of the turnover of our fleet right we have a huge built environment and we have to go at those existing buildings so this is actually retrofitting those existing buildings to bring them up to that level of performance um, which we see manifest through code or exceeding code um, so that's it, that's about the existing building stock um, and you know why we have this kind of Proxy for sales share, which I thought you might also ask, what does it mean to have sales share in a building or not? Is it every time a building changes hand? What we've analyzed in terms of marketplace is how often do we think there are major retrofits happening to buildings? Often that is at the point of sale. Um, and so we've built into the model um, an assumption of the opportunity space and the opportunity timing. And so that's what you see there on that in that right quadrant, uh, that upper right quadrant is that's the opportunities in which we can do upgrades. Um, and, you know, obviously we don't do major upgrades every year. Um, so maybe there's an opportunity space to, to, to shrink that time. Can we look at, you know, if it's, if it can be faster than every 20 years that we might do a major upgrade to a building. Um, so that's probably one of those policy levers and kind of, as we think about how to implement the policies, how do we get faster turnover? Because you'll see that the building stock is, you know, is a fairly slow buildup. Um, and again, we think that's, um, above any kind of normal programmatic approaches that we have today. It's a large building stock that takes a lot of time to upgrade those buildings. So I guess on the one hand, I want to say this is an ambitious set of recommendations that have come from the advisory panel um, and ones that we can further scrutinize over time if we start to see our ability to turn over those building shells faster. Great, thank you. That, that, that clarifies. And I want to do a follow-up to that. So um, I, I recognize the slope changes. We have a very gradual ramp up and then a more accelerated uh, path after 2025. How many mm -hmm. buildings does that actually represent each year once we get past that original ramp up uh, for the deep shell and the basic shell? How many buildings are we actually talking about every year? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think I'd have to get you back to the uh, specifics. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll see if someone through my chat can get me that. But if we, you know, just give you the, the rough math while they're giving it to me. But if it's every, once every 20 years, so it's, um, you know, one out of 20 and you get 100% of that. Um, and our building stock, as you can see in, in the in the bottom slide, is around 8, 8 million households. Um, so let me see if I can get a, a metric for you. Were, were there any other questions while we're looking that up? Uh, just one other one, and, and, and I think this actually gets answered in the images to the left, but I wanted to understand um, when you're talking about air source heat pumps with fuel backup versus electric backup, uh, the majority mm -hmm. of that, from my understanding, based on what you just said, is coming primarily, at least in the early years, from converting from individuals with liquid fuels um, uh, to electric. Um, do you model out a conversion from natural gas to air source mm -hmm. heat pump? And at, at what share of those natural gas customers will retain their natural gas as a fuel backup? I, I'd be interested to know how that was modeled and, and, and how large a representation yeah. that is. I absolutely. So why don't we, why don't I commit to doing follow up with you some of the details, but this graph gives you a sense that in the early years, so the next few years, we definitely see that you'll see that, that the liquid wedges are shrinking. And what mm -hmm. you see predominantly what's happening for the first uh, couple years is that any existing turnover of, of gas systems is, is to a more efficient system. But pretty quickly, you know, you start seeing by 2024, 2025, we're starting to see the bending of, of the gas curve as well. Um, so certainly by mid-decade, we're, we're gonna have to be getting after every fuel type 
Um, and we can certainly um, give you some of those uh, details of the kind of range and uh, uh, rate. But again, you know, you've, we've got to address gas because it's, it's the biggest uh, source of the, of, of the emissions in the building system. Um, and a, and a, kind of a rough ballpark, and I'll get you something more specific later, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of uh, upgrades each year. So building efficiency, probably on, in the low hundred thousand, you know, 200,000, 300,000 each year. Okay. Great. And then final question, just connecting the dots on both the building shell and the uh, air source heat pump question. Do you imagine these happening one after the other or together during a particular upgrade for a particular problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, we absolutely think that it will be a, an efficient electrification process. So when you're working with a customer, you're, you're not just necessarily only switching out a furnace, you're taking that opportunity to also look at upgrades. Um, and that, in, that point of engagement is critical, both in terms of, um, again, shrinking greenhouse gases overall, but also in terms of grid, grid management. Um, but what we see is we're, we're more likely than not gonna have to have a, 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 a system that makes our buildings more efficient in excess of those that are also electrifying. So we will be getting ahead. So I think that the efficiency curve, as you can see kind of from the, the, the point that it's starting earlier, it, it will be a wave that will be in advance. So we will see both electrified and efficient homes happening. We'll also see homes that aren't yet ready to turn over their furnace. They're going to be doing efficiency upgrades ahead. So we could think of that as an electrification ready model where we would be electrifying and making more efficient and then getting buildings ready, whether that be both building shell work and maybe panel upgrades. Um, so I think there, there will be kind of two waves um, where we're gonna have to, um, we're gonna have to do efficiency first in, in some cases. Oh, great, thank you, Carl. And I lied, I do have one more question. So, it, or a statement. It, it sounds yeah. as if um, the, the, based on the framing you've just provided, um, the structure of our future programs will need to absolutely be much more holistic than they have in the past. Uh, looking at the whole building and the prescriptive approach that we may have relied on may not necessarily be what we need to do going forward to achieve the goals we have set for ourselves. Right, I, I would agree with the basic premise there that the kind of the magnitude of the challenge means we have to have a a holistic approach across all of our systems. Um, and then there's going to be a tension there because there are going to be some opportunities where you can get into a building and maybe you can only do the furnace. Um, so I think we would have to kind of play out that tension, but I agree, we have to lean into systems thinking. There's just no way we can hit this magnitude of change without systems thinking. Thank you, Carl. Okay. And finally, I see we have uh, Raya Salter's hand is up. Hello, thank you so much, Carl. Fascinating, um, helpful information as usual. Excellent clarifying uh, quest questions from my colleagues here. You mentioned, you know, about some of the trade offs that you had to look at, in particular with regards to the robustness of the efforts in the transportation system. Um, we know the climate justice working group and others have been, you know, very critical about, you know, um, us not doing enough there. And, and you also spoke to, I think, so this, you know, best in show health metrics, which I'm very excited about, very excited to learn more about. So just in that context, can you help me and others understand how these scenarios, the, the CLCPA is very clear that we must be taking early action on emissions and co-pollutant reductions in disadvantaged communities. So, mm -hmm. so two questions. One, how can, can you walk me through how can I understand how these scenarios reflect that early action or can reflect that early action? And can we have mm -hmm. some type of marker for that? And second, if and how will the final disadvantaged communities criteria with the, you know, specified mapping, you know, be help us, help us further understand that. Yeah, so those are great, great points and questions and um, also agree. I think we've got always had great engagement with the council members. Um, so thank them for the feedback. So absolutely, in terms of early action, I think what these graphs hopefully make clear is that we need, we don't have time to wait. We're gonna have to work on building electrification vehicle electrification, getting heavy duty fleets 
you know, off of their more polluting fuels and onto fuel cells and onto electrification. Um, I think what we can recognize is, you know, where those investments are prioritized are going to be the work of the actual implementation. Um, so I think the opportunity space is being put on the table, right? We have to act quickly. We have to start turning the dial, and these slopes are, are, are pretty incredible. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity. So where do we focus those investments um, will be the work of the implementation. I think we can categorically say that every community in New York is going to substantially benefit in terms of air quality from this work, and that's what I'll be showing you in some of those subsequent slides. We also see there is some concentration in the urban centers um, because that's where we have a lot of diesel being burned, um, which, you know, it's the on-road, off-road diesel um, that often drives a lot of our fine fine particles in the atmosphere, which drives a lot of health outcomes. Um, so I think we will intrinsically from this transformation see substantial benefits across all our communities. And so what we need to make sure in the implementation is that the earliest of those actions are focused both in terms of those health benefits, because they're happening in the communities that have been so disadvantaged uh, disproportionately, and think about how do we leverage those opportunities of investment and job creation. Um, so to, to me, this is the table setting. And then what we need to do is figure out how, how the meal gets served. All right, thank you very much for that. Yeah. Are we good, Sarah, or is there someone else? Yep, that seems to cover all the raised hands. Great, um, and again, I've, we've been jotting down follow-up notes, um, so we'll definitely get some of that more detailed dive. Um, all the data is there. Um, and we'll just make sure that we can extract it in a way that's easy for you all to, to see um, that we can, okay. So to the, maybe it's, it's, it's the main event of today, but I, I, I definitely wanted to um, un unpack some of those drivers of what we're about to see. So uh, yeah, next slide is great. Um, so I wanna walk you through the uh, benefit cost approach. I wanna take a step back though, and we can remind ourselves of how we're going about the work. Um, so I did present some of these slides. There have been a couple of modifications to you all actually going back several months. Um, but what are we looking at when we look at the societal costs and benefits, which is uh, specified in, in, in the law that we need to, to kind of do um, a, a deep dive into what would be the cost of this transformation. There's also savings realized in that transformation from avoided fuel, but then some of the other benefits, the greenhouse gas benefits through the social cost of carbon that's built into the law. Um, and also the uh, co-benefits around health. Um, so again, when we look at these costs, we look at economy-wide resource costs, um, and they have to be relative to a scenario. So what we're looking at is each of these mitigation scenarios versus our reference case. Um, and it, again, focuses on societal costs and benefits. It doesn't in, uh, track what are often called internal transfers. And so if there's a specific incentive that would come out of a policy structure, that's not part of a resource cost analysis. Um, and again, those details would come when we get to the point of implementation. Um, some of the key outputs that, you know, that, we, that we look at when we do the work are annualized capital expenditures. So we're investing in a whole lot of infrastructure here, um, and there's capital costs that, um, that will be um, paid for over time. Um, we also look at operation and maintenance changes of these systems, and that includes you know, not just kind of the the, the folks uh, turning wrenches, but obviously it's the operational and the fuel use. Um, and so in some cases, we'll see increased use of electricity and the subsequent upstream costs that come with that. We'll also see a substantial fuel savings and, and that saves us money, directly saves us money in our system. So we look at annual, uh, uh, our each, from each sector, we look at annual fuel expenses. Um, And I guess just to be clear, and I talked about, no, not quite done there. So we looked at levels of granularity. We, we, do, we do look at kind of regionally, again, looking at ISO zones and thinking about congestion, but we're not able to dig into very specific locational cost information, and we're not looking at specific customer classes. Again, that type of detail comes out when we look at specific policy recommendations. And I think last time I used the example of the Clean Energy Standard where the overall policy formulation, kind of what it looked like, at a broad brush, you know, how it might structure, we then spent a year looking at the clean energy standard and looking at what are the rate impacts from that specific mechanism. Um, so again, that will follow as we think about implementation. Next slide, please. Um, so externality benefits are important. Again, 
they're, they're what's driving this whole mission of the Climate Action Council, and they're called for in the law. Um, so we'll be leveraging the value of avoided greenhouse gases. Um, and what's somewhat novel, I think, in this work, maybe compared to others, is we are systematically looking at each gas. So in the guidance documents that came out from DEC, there is a value of CO2, there's a value of methane, there's a value of N2O. Those are the three dominant gases. We also are able to value HFCs and some of the other super pollutants separately. Um, so we are tracking each gas by on their own and monetizing each of them. Um, and then we do, you know, what in the jargon is the net present value. So we're able to look over the full arc of time for both costs and benefits, add them all up and, and, and compare them. So while you may have nonlinearities in certain parts of that time horizon, we're able to look at the entire expanse and compare that total cost to that total benefit. Next slide. As I mentioned at the outset, and I'll un unpack this in much more detail, um, this expands on the work that I had brought forward previously. So the core of the health analysis is using EPA's COBRA tool. Um, we really have uh, benefited not only from the great input of our agencies in this work, some of the outside experts. We brought on apps, um, and they've been um, uh, marvelous to work with. Uh, they're the ones who built the COBRA tool for EPA. So what we were able to do through this project is do customization of COBRA for New York. Um, so actually dig into the tool itself and make sure that we are being responsive when we look at ambient air quality to the specifics of New York State. Um, and I think, as I mentioned before, you know, we look at uh, SOX and NOx, we look at VOCs, and both the direct and indirect PM that comes from those. And uh, PM is the fine particles or the soot, and that's really the core driver of our asthma, of our heart attacks, um, of our early mortality. Um, and we're not only able to quantify those emission rates, look at the ambient air quality from those, translate those into hospitalizations that are avoided, uh, premature deaths that are avoided, loss of even work days that are avoided, we then monetize those. And COBRA is this, is this great tool that allows us to do that in one clear package. The, the trade-off of that over such a long time horizon, looking at the broad economy, is the level of, of granularity we're able to do is county by county. So, so, Raya, that gets at, we begin to look at at least where we can see disadvantaged communities. Are they concentrated in certain counties? We're going to be able to show specifically how they're benefiting. Um, we also are thinking about how can we go even more granular over time. Uh, there are new tools that my, my R&D department is actually funding right now that may allow us to unpack further. There's a tension, though, when we deal with models that are granular and looking at kind of statewide averages and, um, and getting too granular. Um, with those outputs tends to bring in false precision. So we're kind of cognizant of not wanting to mislead. We would hate to tell a local community that they're getting specifically advantaged if the granularity of the inputs doesn't allow us to, to say that. I feel very confident in the county level outputs that we're seeing. I think we can begin to tease out narrative there. Um, and then we want to work with the uh, climate justice working group over time to, to get even stronger and better and smarter as we do this work. Um, so. New items that we've brought to the table, um, and again, this is because we, we dove into the literature to see where are there studies where we can draw out health benefits that would be in, in addition to the ambient air quality. Um, we looked at other scoping plans, and so the, the uh, first category is around active transportation. Um, and so what we see is by shifting modes, by switching people out of cars and into walking and biking, by getting people out of cars and into mass transit, you actually have specific health benefits that are additional to the ambient air quality of not burning fuel. And so we've characterized those and we've monetized those transportation-based health benefits. Um, the third category, I, I would say, is, is the most uh, nascent. We're pulling from literature, literally from research that's being done last year. We even pulled one national lab study that's still in press, um, where we wanted to look at the indoor environment. Um, and there have been enough years of weatherization programs, which are often focused on low-moderate income communities, or they've looked at health outcomes for those specific individuals and those families. Um, so what we've been able to do is look at how the energy efficiency will be unfolding. And we see that those weatherization programs, um, similar to the question Roy brought up, you know, do we think about it as changing a light bulb or do we think about a system and a home as a system? When we do our energy efficiency upgrades, we aren't just going in there and doing new windows, but we're thinking about how that will affect their indoor air quality. And if they have a mold issue, we're gonna do something about that. And so it's about having comprehensive systems that don't just make them so they have lower bills, but also have better indoor air quality. 
Um, and so we've actually monetized from pulling out from the literature some of those benefits as well, and they're substantial. Um, so we have these three angles that we're taking. It's the ambient air quality that helps everyone, and we've been able to look at it at, at the county level. We've got this mobility and active transportation, new health benefit, and then this very specific uh, low moderate income programs and where we see we're going to be investing in those households and the indoor um, health improvements that we can assess. We, we think that third category is probably a, a, a low estimate because it isn't just low and moderate income communities who benefit from having those energy efficiency uh, uh, retrofits, but it's where we have that, that rich data set because of federal state programs. Um, so I've spent a lot of time on that slide. I'm going to unpack it even more later. Um, but it's, um, you can clearly see that I'm excited by it. It's really great work that our team has been able to bring forward. Um, so next slide, please. Hey, sorry, Carl, I have a quick clarifying question sure. for you. This is Peter, I want to, yeah. um, yeah. I, I, you know, like you, I'm excited about the health benefits stuff and really good, but did you say you contracted or the state had done work with apt associates? I just want to clarify that. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Apt associates okay. is the one who's been running the, uh, who's modified and run the COBRA tool for us. Um, yeah, I the just ones wanted, who, yeah, who I just it. wanted to, um, to clarify that for, for us at the council, but also for those following along in the broader um, internet space today. Thanks. Great. Yeah, yeah. Um, ABT. Um, all right. So um, the last piece, which is more of a foreshadowing, so we're, we don't have any jobs metrics here. Um, it's, it's a bit of the nature of the CLCPA process that has driven us to do this in, in, a, in a sequential way, as opposed to bringing you the kind of full meal at one time. Um, but we're going to take all this microeconomic analysis, which is what's the cost benefit, and we're going to drive it through our macroeconomic tools to look at the, uh, the job creation um, and, we, uh, you know, and also the displacement as part of our just transition working group. Um, and so that work will unfold in the next couple of weeks. It'll be brought first to the working group so they can give feedback and input as they have over these many months. And then next month, we're gonna bring that back to you. Um, but when we look at the literature, look at the programs we've run, look at the levels of investment that are being brought out here, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of jobs that are gonna be created from this, this scale of investment and this scale of transformation. Uh, next slide, please. So there's, I've got three slides here that are somewhat um, uh, benchmarks, but they're important contexts when we think about costs and benefits. And so the first is saying, what's, what's the overall economic situation in which these investments are going to find themselves? And so what I have on this plot um, in the orange is our gross state product. So that's a measure of economic activity in the state. Um, it's growing over time. We're a $2 trillion economy. Um, and so we need to think about that, you know, each year the level of activity is on the order of 2 trillion going out into the future. And so I will be throughout the cost slides be contextualizing some of those costs in that, in that space. Um, and then the other one is obviously population, which is another key driver. And just to give you a sense of kind of what we're forecasting. Next slide. So as a subset of that overall economic activity, it's natural to ask, what about the system expenditure that's specific to the transformation that we're engaged in? Um, and so what we did is you traditionally think about, well, how much do we spend on fuels? And I have a breakout of that uh, um, coming up, but that's the top portion of the stacked bar. Um, so it's on the order of $50 billion we currently spend on all of our fuels. And so that's both in the electricity to buy electricity, as well as the gas that makes the electricity, um, as well as the oil in our homes, as well as the gasoline in our tanks. Um, but what you see here in the full stack up of this system, this, this energy system, it's over $150 billion that we're investing each year. Um, and so part of the challenge of what we see before us in the climate crisis is how do we redirect that level of investment towards clean air and low carbon, right? So the challenge is partly to imagine what our future looks like in this low carbon world and then how to actualize that by reinvesting what we're doing. Um, so it'll be important and I'll again have those uh, sprinkled throughout the slides is you know, what do we see in terms of net cost as a percentage of this overall system spend that we need to do either way. Um, so keep that 150 billion in kind of back of your mind, that's the annual spend. Um, and when I show some of the costs and benefits, I'll be looking at that total cumulative over 30 years, so big numbers, and then we'll do annual snapshots. We'll look at 2030 and 2050. So as we scale up investment, what does it look like in those years to give you a sense? 
Um, and then just to ground that system expenditure in the overall economy, it's less than 10% of our gross state product. Um, so it's a big economy, it's a very complex economy, a large part of it's healthcare, we've got food systems, we've got finance, right? So it's a robust modern economy where the energy system expenditures are um, a meaningful but small fraction of that. Next slide. So final one, just in terms of context setting. So that, that $50 billion of annual expenditure on fuels, um, over half of that 30 billion leaves New York State, right? So we are a net uh, importer of energy right now, um, and a large amount of those expenditures leave. And so um, it's something, again, for important context because that gives us an opportunity. Um, and so part of what we're looking at is import substitution. As we can build more efficiency, as we can put more solar panels on, on rooftops, we are doing import substitution with that foreign fuel. Um, and that is partly what attests to the drive of the, all that uh, job creation is we're actually being able to have our dollars work more, more locally. Um, and then just to give you a little bit of a uh, breakdown and kind of where that falls, uh, our petroleum products, so that's uh, gasoline, diesel, home heating oil, um, is the largest category, it's approximately 24 billion. Um, and when we look at sectors, the uh, building sector overall has, um, spends the most on energy services. It shouldn't be shocking. It's where the fuel is, where our emissions are coming from. Transportation is logically second. Um, and then kind of a little bit of a personal plug to my team. So we have a data market team and I started We produce you know, a lot of this information. So that, that web link is there if you want to unpack some of this core data more. Um, so next slide, please. So that was all the kind of lead up to give you the context and, and, and the framing. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna unpack the, the uh, benefits and costs, just again, to kind of frame it. We're gonna look at cumulative costs on some graphs. We're gonna take annual snapshots in 2030 and in 2050. And we're gonna be juxtaposing those expenditures on infrastructure, the fuel savings, which lead into net costs, and then layering on top of that, those greenhouse gas benefits and the health benefits. So next slide. Um, so I'm going to try to spend a little bit of time here because really this is the, the kind of key summary of our benefits and cost findings. Um, and then really I've got 10, 12 slides that just work to unpack it um, so that you can kind of look at this, these numbers through uh, uh, different lenses. Um, so the kind of headline here is that the cost of inaction exceeds the cost of action um, by more than 80 billion over this full 30 years. What does that mean? We have a net benefit from all these investments and activities that we've laid out across both scenarios. Um, and so while there's significant investment that's going to be necessary, we see, we see that it's accompanied by greater benefits. Um, and so the, the uh, net benefit across our R2 scenarios ranges between 80 and $150 billion. Um, what you see in the graph on the left in the blue is the net system cost. And I'll unpack that. I'll, I'll uh, show you kind of what that's composed of. Um, so what it's saying is when we think about the, the, the expenditures on our infrastructure, um, we're, we're going to have to expend on the order of $300 billion um, that is net above what we would be doing um, already in place. So again, giving you that context I have on the right there. So what is that, that range of costs put in the context of our gross state products and looking at annual snapshots, which I think in some ways are the easiest way to think about it. I'll also explain to you what the cumulative is. But if we look at those costs in 2030, it's less than 1% of our gross state product of what we have to invest in these systems. And out to 2050, as those costs increase, um, it's around 2%. And we look at it in terms of system expenditure. So again, think of that 150 billion each year, around 8% of that in 2030, um, an, an additional 8% will have to be invested to, to make this clean transformation happen. And in 2050, an additional 25% is, is, is um, going to be needed. So I think it's important to keep in context kind of what these billions of dollars mean in terms of the spend that we're already doing. Um, so I'll unpack each of these columns in uh, further detail in the subsequent slide. So next slide. So that, that green bar, which you see exceeds the cost, that's composed of both the avoided greenhouse gas benefits, which in the orange on the, are on the order of 260 billion over the 30 year times, as well as those health benefits. And it's all three of those categories of health benefit that I'll unpack further add up to on the order of 160 to 170 billion. So when we combine that benefit stack, um, it gives us north of $400 billion over the full 30 year time horizon, which again, as I mentioned, is in excess of the cost 
and leads to that, that uh, net benefit to our overall society. Um, next slide. So now I want to spend a little bit of time unpacking what the actual cost categorization is so you can see what's driving those costs and what's driving some of those fuel savings. Um, so here's a bit of a quick glossary. I won't read it all, um, but the major categories are the electric system. So we'll be investing both in the new clean generation as well as in distribution and transmission upgrades. Our transportation investments, you know, predominantly in our ZEVs, um, but also in, in um, investments um, in any other types of energy efficiency within our transportation system. Building investments, which you'll see is, is the largest bundle of investments. Um, so that's the capital and operating expenses for heat pumps and energy efficiency. We have a slice of uh, non-energy, um, which is a much smaller piece of the pie, but that's the investments in agriculture and waste. Um, we have, um, then we have fuels that we'll be substituting. So there's, there's renewable gas, so that's you know, RNG hydrogen, that's renewable liquids in the form of renewable jet fuel and diesel. Um, we have the negative emission technologies that we have to invest in in the out years in order to close the gap um, and hit our carbon neutral economy. There's other, which is a kind of a whole grab bag of um, some of the other investments, some in industry, um, some in the kind of in the distribution system that may be avoiding some costs as we look at the cost of HFC alternatives. Um, and then there's, the, then there's the kind of major fuel types. Um, so there's the fossil gas and the fossil liquids that we will be uh, uh, um, avoiding over time. Those fossil liquids, as I mentioned previously, are our largest expenditure. And so that's where we'll start seeing some of the largest savings. Um, and then we've got some small other fuel incremental costs. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of a preview of then we'll talk into the actual numbers. So next slide. So this slide will take a bit of orientation. Um, so maybe I'll first orient you to the graph and then I'll kind of talk through some of the key findings. Um, and so what you see here on the left are both of our scenarios. So the strategic low carbon fuels and the accelerated transition. Um, you'll note that the zero line of this graph cuts through the columns. So everything above the zero is a net cost. Um, and so you'll see there you've got orange, which is the largest chunk and that's our buildings investment. Um, you've got a smaller chunk in the light blue, which is transportation. Um, and these are infrastructure investments that need to be made, and they are also net investments. So, to the, so we look at the incremental cost, for example, of a heat pump above an existing furnace. Um, there are substantial investments that need to be made in the electric system, and that's that top dark blue. Um, on the left, uh, on our scenario two, where we're also spending on renewable liquids and renewable gas, that's the, that's the cost of those fuels that's added. So when we go uh, below the zero and go into the gray, those are the fuel savings. Um, and so what you'll see is that the net cost of the investments is higher than the fuel savings. So the, the cost of the infrastructure is more, and that's what those blue diamonds represent. They are the net cost. Um, and so that's where we land around that $300 billion of net cost. Um, and then you'll see a shadowy white line. And so we've done some fairly detailed un uncertainty analysis around that net cost. And in our appendix, we, we break that down. We're talking about forecasts of fuel prices and technology costs over 30 years that are highly uncertain. Um, and so what we've done is we've done an uncertainty analysis around each of those cost components, and we've drawn those lines around those, those net blue diamonds. Um, so that's the orientation of the graph. I'll have similar ones that look at annual snapshots for each of those scenarios. And then we'll also compare these costs to the total system investment. Um, so what are some of the key findings? Um, what we can see here is that given the range of uncertainty around these costs, that across both scenarios, we're seeing an actual similar range of net cost. Um, and that's predominantly driven, those costs are predominantly driven by investments in buildings and in the electric system. Um, so that's some of the key takeaway. We're seeing a net cost around 300 billion. Given the range of uncertainty, they are fairly similar costs across each of those scenarios being driven by largely the building system investments and that building stock turnover that I showed earlier and then electric system upgrades. Um, so all scenarios show avoided fuel costs. So those are those gray wedges at the bottom. Um, and it's predominantly, obviously, from energy efficiency where we can reduce how much fuel and then also fuel switching to our all electric system. So scenario two, as I mentioned, it's our strategic low carbon fuels. 
So see there's a large chunk of cost that comes from the renewable diesel, the renewable jet kerosene, that's the dominant cost. And then to a lesser degree, some of that renewable uh, natural gas. When we look at our, our scenario three, we see that there are larger uh, building shell uh, 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 retrofit needs. There are larger investments that have to happen in the grid. So those are larger wedges than in our, our scenario two. Interestingly, right, there's more investment in scenario two to drive those fuels, but you also are displacing more fuel. Um, and so on net, those uh, two scenarios are fairly similar. Uh, next slide, please. So what I hope you see is we're going to be unpacking this and kind of going a little bit deeper each time. So this is now looking at each scenario and giving you a sense for each of the years. And so that first column is 2030 and the second one is 2050. Um, same orientation. So all the colors represent the same subsectors. That blue diamond is the net between cost and benefit. We do see in both the early years and later years, there is a net system cost, um, but it grows dramatically in the out years. And so in the early years, we're looking on the order of $10 billion a year of net system cost. Um, and to give you some of the context, that's, our, that's our less than 1% of gross state product in 2030. Um, and then as those costs and those um, uh, fuel savings grow over time, we see that it grows to the order of $50 billion of net system costs in 2050. So that you, can, you can consider that in, in the out years, what are the annual level of investment? And that grows to around 2% of uh, gross state product. Um, and so again, similar findings as the overarching one driven by buildings and the electric system. We see substantial savings from displaced fuel combustion. Um, and there's significant investments in this scenario in, in renewable diesel in, in the early years um, and less cost for some of the other clean fuels. Um, and then you'll see there's a wedge in the last year um, for the negative e emission technology. Um, and so we do have technologies that are in the prototype phase now. We've looked at studies that forecast the cost as are highly uncertain. We did take as a starting point a conservative um, cost outlook for those technologies, and then we'll pressure test in our, in our sensitivities what might be a lower cost. Um, and so that's partly what's embedded in those whiskers that I showed, those white whiskers on the, on the previous slide. So it's uncertainty around both fuel and technology costs. Next slide. So this is our scenario three breakdown. Um, it's generally a similar narrative. Um, again, on the order in the early years around $10 billion of investment and growing to around $50 billion net in the out years. Um, same key drivers of buildings and our electric grid costs. Um, here they've grown larger because they have to be bigger because um, we don't have some of those other fuels. Next slide. So I want to provide a little more context here. Um, so try to reorient you. The colors are the same, um, but what we're looking at here is an annual snapshot. Um, and the three columns then compare our scenarios to the current system investment. So I ask you to keep in your head that $150 billion of investment we're doing business as usual in our system. And what you see is that the incremental cost in 2030, that additional 10 billion, drives up the cost on the order of 8%. But it is, I think it's important to, to put in the context is that it's not just that 10 billion that we're spending, we're reorienting these tens and tens of billions of dollars from traditional investments in fossil fuel infrastructure into this clean infrastructure. Um, and so it's that reorientation that to me is actually the larger part of the story than the incremental cost in any given year. Um, 2050, obviously those costs grow further as we're having to grow the grid even further and we're having to decarbonize our buildings and our transportation. And so there, again, we see that delta um, of around 50 billion and that's around a 25% uh, cost adder to the overall systems. Um, and so I hope this provides you with some of that grounding in terms of kind of what does it mean that we're spending $10 billion in a year or, or, or $50 billion in, in a year um, as an increment above our business as usual system in investments. Uh, next slide. And so this is now looking back at the cumulative arc. So when we look at the total investment over the 30 years, we see that we're going to be investing nearly $3 trillion, $2.7 trillion in our infrastructure. We have to do that to make sure that our houses are, are staying safe and they're keeping us warm 
that our, um, that our vehicles are able to uh, move us from point A to point B, that our buses and trains are all moving. We need to do that $2.7 trillion no matter what we do. Um, and so when we look at the incremental costs over the entire expanse of these 30 years, it's a 10 to 12 percent adder um, on top of our system investment. And it's roughly the same across both of our scenarios. Next slide. So this is the wrap up slide. I wanted to kind of end where I started. Um, so again, this is orienting to the full arc of the 30 years. Um, so we're seeing again an, a net benefit when we compare those incremental net system costs on the order of 300 billion um, to the benefits of air quality, better health in, indoors, and the avoided greenhouse gas damages that are articulated in our law of looking at what is the avoided value of carbon um, that are north of 400 billion. So on net, you know, we're seeing a range of a net benefit to society from all these investments of between 80 and $150 billion. So I'll pause there. I know, again, another one of those fire hoses. So what I think we'll do is we can do some Q&A, try to unpack some of this, and then we can take a break. So hands are going up. Yep, go ahead. Yeah. Yep, I saw Rory first and then Paul Shepson, and, um, and then we've got a, a few coming up after that. So let's just start with Rory. Great, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Car again, um, I want to echo somebody else's statement. I feel like we could probably do this all week. Um, but I, I do want to ask about the granularity of this. And for, I, I feel like you said it earlier, but I wanted to just go back to it and make sure. Um, when you were talking about the, uh, the reference cases in the various scenarios earlier, um, you were talking about them in the context of doing the analysis within the NISO zones. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm on the same page with that. Is that correct? Right. So when we look at the electric grid uh, build out, maybe we can go to a, an earlier no, slide. No need. Um, just building to the question, actually. I just wanted to make sure I had that understanding. Yeah. Yeah. So if that's the yeah, case, I want to. And it might just be useful just to show it. Can, can the presenter go up? Just, just go back so we can just see the, the sectoral uh, breakdown. I don't know if maybe the slide is stuck. Anyway, keep going with the question. Um, okay. Yeah, so that, that blue wedge, um, no, it's fine. Um, why don't we go to slide 40? Um, no, that, that blue wedge, we break that down into the different parts of our overall grid. And so we're able to look at congestion between the system where you might have to build transmission, you know, upstate to downstate on top of our investments that we're already making. Yep. Got it. Okay. And, and so when, when we talk about the health benefits, um, mm -hmm. the granularity is at the same level? It's at the NISO right. level? Okay. So what we're um, able to do there is um, we do look at for example, transportation activity. Um, we're able to look at, at a county level, where are the vehicles and where the mile is driven. Um, and so we're able to get more granular than the ISO zone. Um, and, and we're able to actually look at, at, at the county level, you know, where are we seeing uh, lower diesel emissions? We're also able to aggregate our generators at that level. So we can actually look at, you know, if we're gonna be burning less natural gas in, at the county level. Um, so we are able to, through a lot of that data digging, the, the kind of lowest common denominator that we've been able to get at at this point is looking at, at the county level. So I, I can tell you that's something I would be very curious to see if you can break down the health benefits at the county level by scenario. Um, and, and I just think the general public would be very much interested in that, understanding how the health benefits distribute throughout the state. Um, and I think this is uh, something that will be incredibly valuable as we think through how benefits should accrue to disadvantaged communities once that definition is established. So I just want to flag that. Um, yep. And, and actually, and, and and you are in, in luck because that's slide 63. So we will get there. Oh, excellent. Great. Okay. So uh, uh, related to that, um, uh, job benefits. So I, I assume there's a similar breakout for job benefits geographically. Yeah, so that's not in the slideshow today. We are gonna look, so we're gonna do kind of the first level of employment statewide. We're not able to get it, that would be false precision for us to do county by county. What we're gonna to try to at least do is kind of regionally. Um, and, the, and the orientation we've charged our consultants to do is look at the regional economic de development areas. Um, and those tend to be aggregated in kind of natural areas around economic activity. 
Um, so we are going to try to give at least a breakdown um, so folks can, can get an understanding that way. But that's that's kind of secondary analysis after we've done the overall statewide jobs assessment. Got it. And then kind of closing out on jobs, I, I the thirty billion dollars that goes out state out of state. Um, this is in reference to the fifty billion in fuels, of which thirty billion goes out of state. Uh, yeah. One could put a number of jobs to that thirty billion dollar number out of state. I'm curious to know what that number would be, if that's something you have available, and then what that $30 billion investment within the state would create from a jobs perspective. Is it a one-to-one? -one? Jobs lost out of state mm -hmm. would be created in state. Is there a multiplier effect? We get more jobs in state per dollar spent than we would if that dollar was spent out of state. Um, not sure if that's an analysis that could be done, but I, I'm curious to know how that would translate. Out. Yeah, great. Yeah, no, we'd love to kind of un unpack as we get our jobs analysis. And I, I think what we're going to find is we're going to have a really rich data set that we'll be unpacking over the course of next year. Um, so great to see that that's that's something that you're interested in, in the kind of digging into. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Yeah. Paul Shepton. I, uh, a couple of questions and a comment. The first question, maybe I missed. But it's about comparing the costs in 2030 and 2050 raises the issue of inflation. Are those all current dollars? They are, yeah. So it's it's awfully small text, Paul. So I apologize for that. But you, when you get the slides, you'll look in the y axis. They're all real 2020 dollars. Oh, there it is. Okay. I, you have to. Yeah, yeah. You've got to change both your orientation and your, your the focus. So sorry about that. So, my questions or, or comment, uh, you know, the 400 or 430 billion dollar accumulated uh, net benefits is impressive, and it remind hopefully reminds us all about the importance of I think uh, what we should have, which is ultimately aggressive PR campaign in New York State that people need to understand that when they're investing in in a heat pump system for their building, they're going to be having cost savings for themselves, improvements in environmental quality and contribution to New York State's economy. So there should be a positive feedback there um, it, resulting from that uh, PR and the potential rate of achievement of the emission reduction goals. And that raises my last question, which is, have you done any analysis of this net uh, difference between benefits and costs as a function of the rate at, of implementation? Uh, one would think since since the cost of carbon in some ways is cumulative, the, the cost of carbon may increase, that the net might be larger with a faster implementation. Have you looked at that? No, we, we haven't done a sensitivity on a more aggressive rate, um, but that's certainly something that we can take back. And you're right, there's a tension there because if you look at the actual guidelines and what came from the um, the federal working group, the value of carbon actually increases over time. There's actually more damages the longer we wait. But when we think about doing a present valuing, we're actually putting more weight on early action, right? So you have that tension that, you know, the out years damage is worse, but we're actually putting more weight on early action. Um, and so it'd be interesting to see kind of how now, if you accelerate further, you know, might you see a net growth? Um, I, I guess I will say that the steepness of those slopes, the level of ambition that we're engaged in here is um, pretty unprecedented. Um, so it, I guess it, it would be an interesting exercise. Um, we'd also just have to take a step back and say, you know, do we think we can really kind of make those black diamonds even steeper? Um, yeah, well, it would be helpful for us to know, you know, I. I we're reminded all the time about the urgency. Mm -hmm. um, so it feels awful darn aggressive, but as uh, Bob for one has reminded us, we're, we're, 
not as aggressive as we wish we were, for example, in the transportation uh, sector. And uh, yeah, I think we, it would be great if we knew the answer to the question, just the sensitivity. Thank you. Great. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Tom Falcone. Hi, oh, thank you. Uh, first, Carl, I mean, a really nice job summarizing an enormous amount of information. That's not easy to do to boil it down into a handful of, of slides. Uh, we're doing a, a really good job of understanding the cost, and you're doing a nice job of also comparing it to how much we would have otherwise spent. You know, the, the question, I guess, on my mind, we look at, for example, incremental uh, investment in the electric sector. I see that on some of the slides comparing one to the other. And I was just wondering if, and it might be in your presentation, or there might be d data that you could summarize for us in a subsequent time. Uh, w is it also available, you know, just what the physical infrastructure might need to look like? You know, what one scenario versus another means in terms of, uh, you know, key statistics by zone. So peak or mm -hmm. energy demand uh, or level of uh, transmission or distribution. I'm just trying to wrap my mind around yeah. what it yeah. means to physical infrastructure. Yeah, so we absolutely have all the new generation infrastructure by uh, by zone. Um, and so we can certainly uh, share that with you. It'll be in our more detailed spreadsheets, but our team will make a note that you, you, you'd like to see that, you know, specifically broken out. Great, thank you. Bob Howard. Thank you, and Carl. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. A, a tremendous amount of material. Like we have to study the details further, but it's 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 quite compelling. Uh, I did want to ask you a couple of questions and maybe raise an issue about the uh, health co co benefits. Uh, so I've, I've got three, well, one comment and two questions, I guess. Uh, on the questions, I didn't see that you're including ozone in that, and I was I was surprised because presumably ground level ozone would go down both in response to less methane and less NOx, so that's one question. I'm also wondering if you included uh, premature deaths in in your calculation, and if so, what the formulas for that. You know, Mark Jacobson and I and others published a plan about eight or nine years ago to take uh, the state of New York to carbon neutrality over a short period of time, say 30 years. And, and interestingly, our, our total costs were about almost twice what you're coming up with now, and I, I think that probably just reflects that the tech Technology costs have come down, but our, our benefit health costs were also uh, substantially larger in part because we estimated that there are 4,000 premature deaths per year from, from burning fossil fuels in the state. And we used the EPA multiplier on that, which I hate to do. I hate to put a value on human life, but any, I'm wondering if that's part of the analysis. And then I just wanted to raise the issue uh, of ammonia, which also wasn't on your figure, and I'm assuming you didn't look at, but uh, I, mm -hmm. I served for several years on a, a, a clean air science advisory committee, a EPA committee that reports to Congress on air pollutants. And towards the end of our time, just before Trump became president, we were putting forward a recommendation that ammonia be a regulated air pollutant in large part, well, because of both ecological, but also health aspects and particularly in urban environments, health aspects. And I would point out that uh, both trucks and uh, cars put out substantial amounts of, of ammonia. In the case of cars, it's because catalytic converters over reduce uh, NOx emissions and there's no prohibition on putting out ammonia. And in the case of diesel trucks, it's because they add urea or ammonia to uh, to cut down on the NOx emissions and they spew out an incredible amount of ammonia. So uh, I would urge uh, taking a closer look at that as well, including it in the health benefits. Great. No, that's some some uh, great great feedback. So um, you you uh, got ahead of one of my talking points. So thank you for teeing it up early. Um, when we get to the health section, so you're correct that we don't specifically look at toxics. Um, it's partly because of the complexity, um, and partly because it's the fine particle emissions that are study after study the key driver of health outcomes. Um, so I think we can say this is conservative when we when I bring forward that you know over 100 billion dollars of health benefits there are going to be air toxics that are also avoided, um, and for the individual who's not exposed to it, they're not going to feel like it's a small number um, when they're no longer exposed. 
Um, so I think that is an, an, an important caveat that we will put in the study that we kind of went after the largest, um, the largest source source of ambient air quality problems in the state, um, and therefore the ones that would have the largest monetization. Um, but it, we are conservative in that we don't we don't cover toxics. Um, so that's certainly kind of a, a, a good caveat there that would that would make the larger bigger uh, bigger number. Um, in terms of ozone. Um, you know, you're, you're correct. We don't explicitly monetize the benefits. We do look at NOx avoided, and that is that does turn into secondary PM. Um, it's an order of magnitude lower when we've looked at studies in terms of what the ozone benefits would, would, would be as, as, as compared to PM. Um, it's not specifically built into the COBRA tool um, for that reason. Um, so again, I think we can say that we're getting the vast majority of the health benefits through this study. Um, and if anything, we're slightly erroring on underestimating and that that green block of, you know, over $100 billion would only grow if we start adding in some of these other health sources. Okay, thank you. Yep. On to Carolyn. Thanks, Sarah. Th and thank you, Carl. Um, just some questions about the assumptions and maybe it's later or it's going to be in the appendix. Can, can you speak to um, how we might see the uh, cost curves that that are being presumed for each of the technologies over the over the time frame um, mm -hmm. for the different scenarios? And then um, I was also curious if you have a uh, cost curve for the per KWH cost of electricity during the transition period. And then finally, you know, we've talked a lot about this. Um, it's going to be a long transition and impacts on consumers. You know, as a utility, we that's what we worry about as well. Um, what would we what would we presume for transition costs and operating costs for a for average groups of consumers like business customers, residential or right. industrial? So curious on what you can add. Yeah, so um, so in, in terms of cost cards, we already have some of that on that resources page that I keep putting up at the front. Um, and I think we already have, for example, cost of solar, cost of wind, cost of you know other uh, uh, nuclear, uh, cost of gas turbines into the future already on that page. It's tab by tab, technology by technology. But if your staff don't see what they're looking for, you know, please do reach out. Um, cause we want to, again, we want to get everything out there. Um, so that everyone can kind of scrutinize this and, um, and give us feedback. You know, we had a great feedback session last winter. Where we reached out to all the advisory panels, um, and got feedback from them from the, uh, utility working group gave us some really great feedback. Uh, really appreciate the kind of time that they spent with us. Um, so certainly, uh, cost curves, we think are in the public domain. Now, if we miss something, let us know. Um, cause that's, that would be an accident, not, not, not by design in terms of the cost to consumers. It goes back to some of the original framing. And that is the kind of the, who specifically pays for these incremental costs depends on the policy implementation. Um, you know, so if, if it's funded, as I'll talk about at the end, you know, through a mechanism, that's more of a carbon fee, that would be 1 structure. If it's a, if it's a structure that, that can come through other mechanisms. Um, you know, and that's something that the scoping plan itself has to lean into to talk about the kind of who pays and how we pay. Um, and that will also then unfold into kind of who will be the primary beneficiaries. Um, you know, if you look at solar today, right, those who are installing are either doing it at kind of a neutral or maybe a, a small savings. Um, and then you think about there's a whole bunch of federal subsidies that are being dropped in there. Um, so it's, it's, it's a matter of the scale of investment is kind of what we're able to articulate here. Um, what will be supported by the private sector versus the public sector? What will come from federal dollars? What will be local expenditures? I think all of that is what the scoping plan has to begin to lean into. And then as we implement those recommendations, we'll be able to kind of see. Um, but clearly this, this magnitude of investment is not something that the public sector steps up and does, right? This is a public private partnership to bring forward this kind of transformation. Thanks, Carl. Next, we've got Kevin Hansen. Thanks, Sarah. Can you hear me? Yes, Ken. Great. Um, so from an economic development perspective, I think people are aware that there's been a lot of state effort in recent years to grow the 
in-state green economy supply chain of businesses in areas like offshore wind and solar and energy storage. And, you know, I think in, in addition to trying to make sure as much of the spending happens in New York State as possible, I think there's also a real hope that we're going to be able to anchor a lot of these nascent growing industries in New York State and become a regional or even national economic hub for, for areas like offshore wind. And really, I just say that to lead up to the question of how are economic benefits treated in this benefit cost analysis? When we think about mm -hmm. personal income to New Yorkers, tax revenues from jobs and investment, um, are those captured in, in the benefits or are those kind right. of upside? You know, how, how should we think about the economic aspect of, of growing the green economy in the expenditures within the state that may result from this? Yeah, so, you know, great, great question. I don't think I was clear at the outset. So um, those macroeconomic impacts of job creation, of gross state product changes, increases, as we do that import substitution are not included in this microeconomic analysis of costs and benefits. Um, so we would consider um, those economic activities that we spur in the state from these investments as being an additional benefit narrative um, that would come alongside this cost benefit. Got it, thank you. And next we have Rose Harvey. Hi. Um, I, I think you've answered my question, but um, just to be sure, you, you talked about the, you know, in one of the scenarios, the 10 billion additional cost above and beyond the bigger story of harnessing uh, all those costs uh, into uh, energy efficiency, what we currently spend. But won't they be much bigger? It, taking and converting what we currently spend into entirely new technology isn't that going to be do you include the extra expenses of doing that exactly yeah so let me and actually this slide is helpful so what we're saying is there is an incremental cost above that 150 billion that should be the number we kind of keep in our head um, and so in 2030 if we're going to be spending 160 billion that 10 billion is that in additional investment that we'll need to make because a heat pump appliance in the next eight years is gonna have an incremental cost above and beyond what your traditional furnace would do. So a ground source heat pump costs more to install than a gas furnace. And so those incremental investments that we, that we need to make are that additional 10 billion. So you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and then that's offset by the fuel savings. And so, you know, you need to look at the full life cycle of, of the product, but there will be on net a larger investment that will need to be made. And, you, and you've got it and you believe it's incremental. Exactly. Got, I got you. And then also just quickly, I mean, you're gonna get to it and this was just about costs, but on the macro economic, macro health benefits, it goes to what somebody said is that that slide will be so important to have them side by side so you don't flip the page and say, oh, by the way, there are these other health right. benefits. Or, yeah, but I, I get that you're yeah, yeah. getting that. Yeah, totally agree. So we're gonna get to the health here more. You know, when we wrap the scoping plan at the end of year, we're gonna you know, set the whole table and we're gonna have that comprehensive narrative of here's the benefit cost, it's a net benefit doing our microeconomic analysis. In addition, we have this, this um, macroeconomic story that came out of our job study. So it will all be set together, absolutely. Gotcha. This is great, R really great and so clear. Um, uh, you, you know, I would not normally be able to follow it at all. You, you, thank you for condensing it all down and making it so clear. Uh, thank you. Dennis Elsenbeck. Thank you. Uh, thanks again, Carl. Carl, I'm trying to wrap my head around this, you know, kind of like this infrastructure expenditure 
and uh, you know, looking at you know, kind of like how policy creates these uh, issues where we we we've gone all in on building uh, solar and wind, but we've developed them in pockets uh, as opposed to co-location with load centers. Uh, so what sometimes that miss, and then we have to do another order to connect the, those generation pockets mm -hmm. together. I mean, are you seeing this potentially as a, as a way to reinvent maybe integrated resource planning so that we're always constantly looking at supply, demand, and delivery as a comprehensive regulatory viewpoint? And then do we then allow ourselves to think about well, if these are the projected costs that you have on there, are they targeted costs that maybe if I have um, a, a, an alternative, a non wires, a more progressive view of non wires mm -hmm. alternative, or how about combining uh, economic development challenges that are out there because we have a lot of infrastructure challenges. So instead of treating them separately or, or, or in the hands of, you know, trying to attract somebody to New York, can that be part of an integrated solution so that, you know, we're, we're, you know, the regional economic development councils know these sites. So instead of thinking just about the CLCPA, uh, can't we kind of like contemplate combining these as an integrated strategy um, and then really optimizing uh, transmission distribution planning going forward? Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's consistent with, I think, what we heard earlier from Rory Christian about systems thinking. We need to think about buildings as systems, and we need to be thinking of, of the grid, not in a piecemeal IRP way, but as an integrated step. And I think that, you know, the, the work that the legislation that came out last year and drove our power grid study has kind of set the tone um, where we were, where our Department of Public Service was calling forward planning at local distribution, local transmission and bulk transmission in one space, right? Um, and it's complex and it's hard. And I think that the power grid study was the first real step that we took to try to wrap that into one space. Um, but I, I agree that the, that the magnitude of the challenge, the, the uh, complexity of the systems, the degree we have to grow the grid, we, we have to do that in a way that thinks of it as a whole system. Great. Gavin, Gavin, Gavin Donahue. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, uh, thank, thanks again, Carl. I'm trying to, to just figure something out. Um, and it goes back to the beginning of the presentation today. And there was a passing reference to carbon pricing. I think everybody on this table on the council knows that what we're talking about is gonna cost a lot of money, no matter how you slice and dice it. But there was a passing men mention to carbon pricing at the beginning of the presentation. We have a social cost of carbon out for DEC. Um, we've been a proponent of carbon pricing. As part of this analysis on the cost, are we using carbon pricing as a way to help defray some of the costs associated with this? I just don't understand why carbon yeah. pricing was mentioned at the beginning, and then we got into all yeah. these costs. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to get yeah, at what, that, what's driving that. Yeah, I would love to answer that. So. I mentioned carbon pricing and table of contents because I do have a slide on it, and really it was me trying to keep track of the promises I've made. So I, I did last time promise the council that I would come and give an update of some of the additional work that we are trying to scope out to look at carbon pricing. So you're, you're correct, a bit of mixing what I call the how versus the what. So this story I gave you on the 1st and the 14th is, you know, what the system might look like, and this is giving you the scale of investments that might be needed and the fuel savings. How we do that, so how we fund this transformation, how we empower and encourage uh, folks to, to make new choices, that comes in the, in the articulation of the scoping plan. Um, and so really carbon pricing is one of the arrows in the quiver of the how we would get it done. Um, and what's unique about carbon pricing is it really requires to, to kind of look at some of the analytics around it, it requires different tools than what we had originally brought to the table. So that's what I'm exploring now. What other support can I bring to the council to help us look at carbon pricing? So that my, my final slide to kind of wrap up my talk today, I'm gonna to unpack kind of uh, where I am 
Um, but really, that's going to have to be engaged in by the council as you deliberate over how this can be funded and how this can get, get done. Um, so hopefully that helps to uh, clarify where I may have confused things by introducing a little bit of the how. But it's, I wanted to make sure that that thread wasn't lost because um, it is something that I've heard loud and clear, both from the council and from the climate justice working group, that we need to, you know, uh, look at that issue. Thank you. Paul Shepton. Get myself unmuted. Just a, a quick question about the air quality, mm -hmm. human health benefits. Uh, uh, following on to Bob's question, um, you sort of mentioned that it's complicated for ozone, and I assume you meant because of the complex photochemistry that produces ozone, and that made me wonder if the PM 2.5 aerosol benefits are from just the direct emissions because maybe half of aerosol is produced photochemically in the process that makes ozone. So I'm just wondering if maybe the human health benefits are even greater yet. Right, so we do look at the direct and indirect um, fine particulate matter. So it isn't just the soot coming out of a tailpipe, but it is those uh, secondary PM emission. So okay. partly it's the complexity. Um, so it's like hard to squeeze that lemon, but there's just also not a lot of juice that comes out of it. It's an order of magnitude less than the PM. So um, so again, it's it's kind of where the tools focus their 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 energy. Okay, got it. Thanks. Yeah. And Raya Salter. Hello. So Carl, just fascinating, tremendous. Thank you so much. And it seems like there's really significant conservatism in the benefits here. And I look, I just look forward to those becoming even more robust. We know that jobs is going to add, you know, another layer of, of, um, of benefit. And also on this health piece, I just want to chime that I really encourage those deeper looks into toxics, ozone, ammonia, and also things like, you know, the negative impacts of residential gas use. I think that, you know, we know that the, the science is sort of improving and we're learning more and more at this areas. And I think that as we also think of prioritizing, you know, early action for disadvantaged communities, we're just going to see that benefit continuing to grow. And I just really encourage us to um, formally capture that. I also wanted to chime that I think it's fantastic this idea of what can we save through systems thinking and coordinated planning, and I hope we can formally capture that as well. So that said, I do have uh, two questions. Another big area, and I know we're going to continue to you know to study it, that where I think tremendous benefit will be reflected um, is resilience and hardening of infrastructure. I presume that there's some th some stuff here may be baked in. I'd be interested to know and your thoughts on what else we can expect from resilience. So that's one question. And then my second question is that clearly, from what I can see, you know, scenario this away from combustion scenario seems like a win-win when you consider cost. Um, I just wonder if you know it's, it costs less appears to be a win-win. I was wondering if you agree with that. So two questions, one about the resilience mm -hmm. and second about right. the, the advantages of this scenario. Yeah, so so re, re, resilience is definitely kind of uh, front of our minds. We had a great presentation last time on the topic. This will not be a resilience plan, um, but we have factored in some of the climate change impacts into the work itself. So when we think about um, more extreme summer weather, so we're going to need to have higher saturation of air conditioning and cooling centers to kind of help deal with that. So there's going to be higher load just intrinsically from that. Um, and, but I think, you know, we will need to do a phase two of work to begin to really pull together the kind of the nexus of our resilient and low carbon system. Um, and the climate assessment will be the first opportunity to kind of really bring those two houses, you know, into yep. one where we'll be able to, to kind of look at different scenarios of, we have a certain amount of climate change that's baked in, right? We've taken 30 years to kind of get to where we are. Um, and so we just have that legacy um, that our low carbon systems will have to adapt to. Then there's yet more extreme climate change that we're trying to avoid. So we're talking about looking at a couple of scenarios of kind of what's already baked in versus what is the extreme of uh, no action. 
and then look at how that impacts a business as usual system and a low carbon system. Um, so that's absolutely follow on work that, that's going to be critical. Uh, one clarification there, does that yeah. also include the hardening of systems to prevent, you know, for more resilience for our actual energy systems as we go forward to prevent blackouts, et cetera, et cetera? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So that would be looking at kind of what's going to be necessary above and beyond. So we already have the, the, uh, our reliability standards built into this work. So we're making sure that the lights stay on, but it, I'll be, you know, it is grounded in mostly our current paradigm of the system as we know it. So what we need to now do is kind of change that paradigm and think about what are alternative and new ways that we have to harden and go beyond maybe some of our current uh, kind of uh, best practices, which are baked into this. Um, and, and then, I'm try what was the second question again? Just that it, it appears that our away from combustion scenario uh, um, right. is, seems to be a win-win, heads or tails, benefit. <laughs> <laughs> what it do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, I, I mean, absolutely both scenarios are, an, are a net societal benefit. So I think that's kind of a, a strong set of news that comes out of this. We are seeing slightly higher health benefits from scenario three, as you would expect. Um, you know, I'll unpack that a bit more in the slides. It's, um, it's incrementally better because both systems are electrifying heavily. We're just, we're just reducing dramatically combustion across both worldviews. Um, and so I guess I'd see both scenarios offer winning opportunities. And so what we need to flesh out in the scoping plan are what are, the, what are some of the other lenses that we need to bring to bear? So health is important. That needs to be part of the narrative. Um, we also need to look at technology adoption and look at the kind of uh, rates of adoption. So we need to look at the full suite of risks, I think, to kind of have a matrix that says, you know, in these worldviews, there are pros and cons, but I guess I'd say we're seeing a pretty strong positive narrative across both of them because of the net benefits that we're getting from both of them. Yeah, although significant less cost involved in three as well. Yeah, and there's so definitely there's there's less cost, but I, I do want us to think about those bounds of, of uncertainty. Um, and we, we just need to be careful around false precision in this work, which, which can be easy just because it's very uncertain what the fuel prices are and the technology cost evolution. So on that first graph, it, they were light, but there was those error bands that we put around the work. Um, and so we just, we need to hold in our mind's eye both of those realities that, you know, the absolute middle range, they are not the same, but when we look at those bands of uncertainty, um, we just need to be clear that they're in the same range of net cost. Lots of uncertainty in particular with unproven technologies, um, experimental um, technologies. All right, thank you so very much. There's not, there's, yep. you really are just, there's so much that you folks are crunching here. It's fascinating. No, thanks for the question. Peter, I want to wait. So thanks, Sarah. I just have some observations. And um, first off, thanks, Carl. This is, um, been an amazing sort of download of information and very comprehensive stuff presented. And I really appreciate the time and energy of you and your team putting it all together and walking us through. Just a couple of observations. Um, first off, I'm just reminded of the tremendous wastefulness of internal combustion, uh, particularly in the transportation sector when you look at these costs and benefit numbers. I mean, you know, to Paul Shepson's point, getting out there and just really having a direct conversation about just how much is wasted when we burn motor fuels to move people between point A and point B? Um, you know, the, these cost and benefit sort of scenarios really wash over me just knowing that just it's such a wasteful way. <laughs> it's either heat or uh, uh, going out the tailpipe and then it's driving up uh, healthcare costs for us all. So I'm, I'm looking forward for the deeper dive on the health uh, benefits section because I think that's tremendous and it gets at a really key point, uh, I think that's that's embedded in the CLCPA, and we heard from the Climate Justice Working Group over the last several months, is, you know, with greater emphasis on reducing pollution in New York State with an eye towards equity and justice for those who have been on the receiving end of the assaults of air emissions. Um, to Rory's question earlier about where we'll see the, 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 the county by county stuff, it's just fall the pollution, Rory, um, and that's where we're gonna see the benefits really accrue most, because those are the people who are being harmed the most. Uh, and that's where we see the greatest loss of life. Um, so anyways, I, I wanna just sort of close out with those observations, but also elevate Raya's last point she made there. I mean, I think scenario number three is probably less costly and more beneficial. Um, and then also overlay with that, the, the 
equity provisions that we heard so eloquently from the climate justice working group about um, pathways that um, are, are better for for disadvantaged communities. So thanks. Mm -hmm. No problem. So I'm not Can sure we if we treat? have new hands or old hands, but yeah, mm -hmm. We do have um, in the chat, Marie Trees Dominguez has a question for you. Oh, okay. Hey, Carl. Um, fantastic job uh, putting this together, and the presentation is, is just amazing. Um, just a really quick question, and that is I just wanted to lift up a little bit of uh, Raya's question with regard to resiliency and hardening. So I heard what the answer, what, how you answered it. I just wanted to make sure that I understood how you were saying the cost would then be factored in because on the previous slides, you talked about the investment level um, for infrastructure writ large. So I wanted to understand how then for the purposes of the integration analysis, mm -hmm. how these additional costs for resiliency and um, hardening would then be considered. Great, yeah, no, thanks for giving me the space to, to unpack that more. So hardening comes in many forms. So the hardening of, of, of the grid in order for it to be able to deal with the kind of some of the extremes and potentially some, some, some of the heat, we've been able to at least at a proxy level incorporate that. So we've got hotter summers that we need to then have a grid that can, can support it. Um, so that infrastructure spend you see here includes that. What it does not include is the comprehensive resilience plan. You know, do we need larger uh, culverts in order to allow flood water to get through? Are we someday in kind of an extreme view if we don't take action and have to build seawalls, what would that be? So that's not included in this study. So that, you know, we will be looking at some of those, you know, those adaptation and, and, and resilience issues in our climate assessment. Um, so that's going to be kind of our next step of a more comprehensive look at the resilience and the cost of no action. Um, so this is not, just to be clear, not a comprehensive look at the resilience of our system. Um, this is really focused on what the transition of the energy system looks like um, and focused, you know, where we could on the electric grid to help to begin to think about, you know, what it will look like with hotter summers um, and, and some of those other kind of uh, extreme issues. Thank you for the clarification, because there's a whole other level of investment mm -hmm. that needs to be examined on that front. Thank you. Absolutely agree. Yeah. And I see that we have the Rose Harvey has her hand up, but I'm not sure if that's um, a legacy hand or if she has a new comment or question. It's just a legacy. Sorry. All right. No problem. That looks like all the, the current questions, Carl. Great. Awesome. So I think we're probably at time for a break. Folks want to stretch um, and then we will return maybe and we'll tee up the next section. Sarah, I know we're probably a little bit behind. So how much time do you think? Um, I would say be back by 3.30. Is, is that uh, reasonable? Okay. We're getting head nodding. So Sounds good. Yeah. Everybody yeah. run. <laughs> All right. Thank you. See you in, in uh, eight minutes. Thirty-one, Carl. You want to? Um, yeah, let's get going. Get started. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, welcome back. We're in part two now. Um, so, what we have left on the agenda is a look at the electricity system sensitivities, um, and we'll try. There's some really rich information here. I'm going to be joined by a colleague from E3, um, and maybe uh, Kevin. When I turn it over to you, you can do just a very brief intro, just to orient folks as to the role that you've been playing. Um, and I think we'll try to motor through this, do a, a short Q&A here, and then we'll dive into the health. Um, and I'll just do an end cap at the end with some of the carbon pricing. So next slide, please. Um, so as we had discussed at a previous meeting, um, there was a question on the table of, I think it went the wrong direction. So other way, please. 
There we go. Thank you. Um, so there was a question on the table of looking at um, the impacts of choices around technology for the electric system um, and specifically looking at um, what we might see in terms of an expenditure impact uh, for different technologies being available. Um, and so what we looked at was we took scenario three to help us understand that question. And that's, that's the column in the center there. Um, and so that's the, the total investment that we've needed for scenario three. Um, we, we did a control though. We, we controlled it against a counterfactual that was fully electrified. So to not confuse ourselves of kind of a growing grid um, and, uh, and what we were gonna compare that cost against. So it's a, it's a reference case that's fully electrified um, and then layering on top of it, making it a, a zero carbon grid. And so the absolute number is kind of less specifically interesting and more the kind of relative changes. So when we compare that dark blue graph, we look to the left on the waterfall. Um, and in our scenario three, again, to remind us, uh, we were, it was an accelerated transition away from combustion. So the small amount of um, energy that we still needed to spend on our zero firm resources that were predominantly hydrogen fuel cells, so it's a non-combustion way. Um, we looked at what would have been the, the um, cost if we um, cost improvement if we were to allow for the combustion of that small amount of hydrogen. And so it actually saves our electric system $10 billion um, over the arc of those years. Um, and then we further looked at um, if we used RNG, which is a slightly less expensive fuel than the, um, than the green hydrogen, it would save an additional $5 billion. Um, so again, trying to put some bounds and an understanding around what are the implications of some of the technology choices. Um, obviously, scenario three as it stands is a, is a net benefit. Um, and so, you know, there's, it's not saying that it isn't, it's just saying that you could potentially see some lower cost outcomes in the electric sector um, with those arrows in the quiver. Um, in addition, we looked at the case of what if um, the uh, nuclear fleet upstate wasn't re-licensed. Re um, and so the, the core scenario said that there was a relicensing of fleets as we're seeing around the nation. The first few fleets are kind of rolling into their relicensing. Re um, and so um, we assumed in the scenario three of, okay, what if they are relicensed re and then are phased out at the end of that period? If instead they weren't, um, we would see an additional $10 billion of cost um, if our upstate nuclear fleet. So looking at what would need to substitute for those retired nuclear plants. Um, and we see that there's a, a meaningful amount of extra cost. Um, so, so that's a bit of that technology sensitivity. Um, what this leads us into then is also to think about, okay, there are alternatives for long duration storage. Um, and hydrogen is kind of our current proxy. It's, it's a known entity. We know that there's some exciting technologies that the advisory group had talked about. Um, and so what I wanted to do when I've asked Kevin to join us on is first to talk about the uh, dynamics of the system to give you a sense of kind of why we think we still need that firm zero emission resource. And then to pressure test if we didn't have kind of what would be deemed of an off the shelf firm resource, which would be either um, a combustion turbine or potentially a fuel cell if we grow them at scale using hydrogen or RNG. If we had some other technology that was actual storage, um, what would we need to see in terms of system build to supplant that, what I mentioned last time, roughly 20 gigawatts of low carbon firm resource. So Kevin, hopefully uh, you can hear me. Um, you can do a quick sound test and then I can turn over the mic to you. Great, thanks Carl. Can you hear me okay? I can, you're coming in clear, thanks. Great, um, so by way of Quick introduction. Um, my name is Kevin Steinberger, and I'm an associate director in E3's resource planning practice area. And I've been leading the electric sector analysis as um, one part of our integration analysis, um, working working closely with Carl and others. Um, and it's great to have the opportunity to uh, speak with the, the council today. Um, so as Carl mentioned, this, this slide is examining the role of different technologies in providing a firm zero carbon capacity need. And over the next several slides, I'll review both the role and the need for those types of resources within the context of our overall portfolios. And we'll discuss our electric system dynamics at a higher level of resolution than was presented during the last meeting. 
can go to the next slide, please. So our mitigation scenarios involve a, a significant expansion of wind, solar, and battery storage, which we consider to be the foundational resources to both meet New York's clean energy and emissions targets, while also meeting uh, increases in demand driven by the electrification of industry, buildings, and transportation. Large amounts of firm zero carbon capacity are also needed on this system to maintain reliability. Um, and again, in these scenarios, that, that new zero carbon solution is met by hydrogen fueled resources. So if we go to the, the next slide, um, we can look at this same portfolio of, of resources through the lens of each resource's contribution to meeting annual electricity demand in 2050. Um, so in-state wind and solar provide a, a large share of New York demand across these scenarios with wind providing between 31 and 34% of demand, uh, solar providing uh, between 36 to 40% and collectively wind, water and solar meeting between 90 and 95% of uh, electricity demand by 2050. So, although a large amount of firm capacity is needed to maintain reliability on the system, uh, we expect that utilization of those resources over the course of the year will be low and will only be needed during challenging times of low renewable output. Go to the next slide, please. So um, we've examined our, our resulting portfolios and the, the system operations on a more granular time scale. Um, so this is zooming in um, from the previous slide, which showed annual generation and looking at both a weekly and hourly time scale for a, a few different weeks. Um, so first, the bottom chart shows the average weekly output from different resource categories over the course of the year. Um, so moving from the, from the bottom of this chart up, we have existing clean firm resources, such as the upstate nuclear and hydro units shown on the very bottom in beige, followed by offshore wind, onshore wind, then offshore wind, and then solar and yellow. And lastly, on the, on the top of the chart, we see uh, the red indicates times of excess renewable output while the gray indicates times of the year when an additional zero carbon firm resource is needed, um, which again is, is modeled as a hydrogen based resource um, in, in scenario three. Um, so first we'll look at, we'll zoom in a little further into a uh, typical spring week. So the, the week selected here, um, and we can see that coupled with contributions from existing nuclear and hydro, Renewables are able to, to meet uh, most of New York's electricity demand over the course of the week. We have short duration lithium ion batteries able to provide uh, intraday balancing and fill the gaps um, during some times of lower renewable output um, over the course of this week. And lastly, in, during this, this spring week and um, often over the course of the, the spring and fall when loads are are a bit lower. Uh, we do have periods of excess renewables beyond what can be used to charge short duration batteries. So this um, excess could be used to produce hydrogen or to charge a, another long duration storage solution. So if we move to the, to the next slide, we'll examine a more challenging week uh, in order to examine the role of, of firm capacity on the system. So we can see um, our arrow has shifted and we're now focused on a week in the middle of the winter. Um, and the first thing to note is that as we've added electrification loads to the system, we're increasing the, the magnitude of load on the New York system, but we're also uh, changing the timing of load as well. Um, and so in particular, as we electrify lots of building heating needs, we project that New York becomes a, a winter peaking system by by 2035 and winter peaks are uh, much higher than summer peaks by, by 2050. Um, so this is a week that, that represents real weather data uh, where we have um, relatively cold temperatures and so, so loads are high, 
And that's coupled with a period of multiple consecutive days of low renewable output. Um, so the first thing that we can observe in the hourly dispatch in this week is that most of the battery storage, uh, the, the purple at the very left of this chart in day one, is depleted quickly at the beginning of the week. And then for the next several days, there are no times of excess renewables to recharge that storage. Um, and so even though we're, we're looking at the same system as the previous slides, and so we have um, over 100 gigawatts of, of solar and wind on the system, average output from those resources is, is low during this week. Um, and so we find that we need the, a zero carbon firm capacity solution um, during these types of weeks to, to ensure that uh, we can maintain reliability on the system um, and get us through periods of low wind and solar output. Um, and you know, we think that the, the overbuild um, of solar and wind and short duration batteries um, would be really significant and, and uh, very costly to um, try to maintain reliability if we did not have this type of firm capacity solution available. So um, this, this slide is focused on a, a firm hydrogen fuel based resource, but we've also uh, looked at a number of different technologies that can meet this, this firm capacity need. Um, and so um, we've looked at uh, long duration electrochemical storage. Um, so we can think of hydrogen as, as fuel based storage where uh, we can use excess renewables during the spring and fall to produce hydrogen that can be then be used for firm capacity needs uh, during the winter. Um, we've also examined the, the reliability on the system if we consider a uh, long duration battery solution. Um, and so here, what we've done is removed the hydrogen capacity from the system and examined the amount of 100 hour storage that would be needed to maintain the, the same level of reliability on the system. And we find that in addition to uh, additional renewables that are needed to charge the storage, about 31 gigawatts of 100 hour storage would be needed to replace the 25 gigawatts of hydrogen based capacity that we, we have on our system in scenario three. Um, and if we move to, to the next slide. Um, this just examines for the same week and the same weather conditions, uh, the, the operations of the system. If we have more renewables and 100 hour storage, um, so we can see that there's um, additional, in particular, offshore wind contributing to uh, load during this week, as well as um, 100 hour storage that's, that's filling the gap when there are times of, of low renewable output. So across all of our scenarios, there's a significant expansion of wind, solar, and battery storage, um, which again are considered to be foundational resources to meet the state's goals. Um, we also find that there's a need for a firm zero carbon resource on the order of tens of gigawatts to maintain reliability during these multi-day periods with high loads and low renewables output. Um, and our analysis has examined a, a number of different solutions to provide that system need, which, which could be met by um, several different emerging technologies. Um, and with that, I'll pass the mic back to you, Carl. Great, thank you, Kevin. That was perfect and you kept a good pace. So thank you, thank you for that. And thank you and the team for all the hard work that you've been leading here. Um, glad that we pulled you from the West Coast to come live with us. Um, for the course of this project and hopefully permanently. Um, so hopefully council members appreciate, I know we went into some weeds here, but I wanted to unpack at the beginning a deeper dive because people asked for it in transportation buildings. I got a number of questions around flexibility and around how the grid would operate during these kind of winter doldrums. So I thought it was it would be good to kind of bring Kevin to, to kind of unpack that a bit further um, than, than we did previously. So I think um, we can go to the next slide just to hold it there. But before I go into health, maybe we can pause and just see um, if there's any specific questions around electricity. 
Uh, Bob Howard. Yeah, uh, th thank you for that, Kevin. Uh, I just want to raise the issue I, I, I made earlier in this, today's meeting, which is uh, if we use more ground source heat pumps instead of air source heat pumps, then those winter dynamics at the very coldest times, I think, would change substantially. So I, I my question is, have you looked at that? If not, I strongly believe we, we must do that. I'd also uh, urge that we look at thermal storage and not just electrical storage. And we can store thermally, if you have a ground source heat pump, it's, it's, it's easy to store a, a couple of days of, of heat reservoir in, in one's home. There are also uh, you know, ways to store thermal energy over seasonal time periods and, and, and bleed it back out. And I, my, my reading of literature is that's more cost effective than storing the electricity. So I'm, I'm curious as, as to whether that's being included in the analysis as well. Thank you. Great, yeah, so maybe, um, Kevin, we can, I know we have teed up a sensitivity to ground source heat pump, so maybe we want to save that for a, another time. Um, so we can just confirm, Bob, that that is work in progress, um, and we'll kind of at, we'll advance our thinking as far as we can um, in the time we have. And then, you know, I think we want to show the promise of ground source heat pumps and begin to tee off that, um, you know, what are some of the economic trade-offs there? Um, but I think we want to build momentum around building a market for ground source because it's, you know, if we can get the cost out, it, it clearly is um, it's an incredible resource that we need to scale. Um, we just have to figure out how to get the cost out of it. Um, but I know, Kevin, any other thoughts there around? Um, just just let me interject, Carl, that I, I agree. Yeah. I mean, as, as one who heats my own home with a ground source heat pump, I agree it's more expensive. The payback period is a little bit longer for me than if I used air source heat pumps, but it's, it's still very much worth it to me. And, and, and going back to the points made earlier, we need to look at this from the entire system standpoint. And it may mm -hmm. be that we're better off subsidizing homeowners to have ground source heat pumps if we don't need to have as much hydrogen capacity or as much wind or solar capacity. Those are system level trade offs. And, and you know, my yep. guess is that the ground source heat pumps will come out to be one of the least expensive ways for the state as a whole to solve that winter peak, nasty, cold, dark, calm time. Yep. We'll see. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. You aren't you aren't selling New York to, to, to my California consultant, Bob. Um, but no, that's absolutely. I mean, that's part of why we want to have an integrated framework here is to look at those trade offs because often we look at them in isolation. So that's absolutely why we have E3 on board to to, to do these types of sensitivities for us. But any other thoughts, Kevin? Or? No, I think you covered it well, Carl. I okay. think the ground source uh, sensitivity is definitely on our list. Great, thanks. I think I Next, see... we've got Tom Falcone. Yeah. Hi, Carl and Kevin. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, that's a, a really uh, difficult analysis to simplify. I think you did a nice job. It's something that if you know you're in the electric business, you're you're kind of familiar with what those low weeks look like. But uh, I think for most people, it's not not necessarily intuitive. So you did a really nice job. Um, I mean, what I'm taking from it is you're saying you need something that looks like hydrogen as a, a method for storage, and you can have 20 to 25 gigawatts of that, or you need something like 60 gigawatts of excess overbuild of generation, plus the ability to integrate it, transmission, and move it around the system. And so when I think about that from a uh, physical infrastructure perspective, that's huge. I mean, that's, you know, you need twice as, you know, to build twice as much offshore wind. I'm going to assume a lot of that's downstate just based on the fact that offshore wind is what you selected. I'm just wondering about the cost of that too, because there's a big, you know, building out a system, building out twice as much offshore wind, for example, that would strike me as you're moving way up the cost curve for that. Yeah, so we don't have a cost, I don't think, estimate now, but that's something that, that we can look at. Is that right, Kevin? That's right, Carl. Yeah. We've just been focused um, on the yeah. equivalent right. reliability of that system first. Yeah, but we can we can certainly look 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 into that issue for you. Yeah. Rory Christian. Uh, so, so Tom illustrates why I always want to raise my hand first. Um, he beat me to the punch. Um, 
so yeah, I, I have the same question on costs for the alt scenario. And you mentioned it earlier, Kevin, um, you did say the overbuild of renewables would be more costly, but I, I very much think it's important for us to understand the magnitude of that cost, um, not just from the infrastructure itself, i.e. The, the wind and solar, but the transmission infrastructure and related investments needed to connect that to where it needs to go. Um, so if, if that's something that could be done, I think that would be a great value uh, to this group and to the general public. That yeah, sounds good. And I think we can put some bounds around what the hypothetical storage itself would cost. I mean, we've seen some great news around metal air batteries. So, you know, we can try to do some high lows around that. Part of it was the exercise was to characterize as a useful thing for New York, what would it look like? What kind of characteristics might the system have? But we can look into some of those uh, sensitivities. I think we'd have a high low range around what that might look like. Gavin Donahue. A couple points, a uh, couple questions. Um, to meet these goals, we obviously have to invest in a lot of new stuff. And we talked a lot about this today battery storage, wind, solar. I, I get all that. What is factored into E3's analysis or Carl's analysis on existing renewables and keeping those recs and those investments in New York to meet these goals? Because since we've had the clean energy standard, uh, the wind and solar are going other places, and so is the hydro. Uh, what do we? Does your analysis factor in keeping that 27% of existing uh, mix or energy mix in the state because they're they're going to be critically needed to help achieve these goals. We don't want to lose our existing resources. So that's a question. Yeah. So state. yeah, yeah. So the so the simple answer does follow the the assumptions in the order around our clean energy standard. So the. The commission laid out an assumption around what the base was. And so we've replicated that base assumption in our going forward systems analysis. Um, you know, the kind of the how of how that plays out is certainly something that the council should discuss. So what you're saying is how to keep these resources in New York to meet New York's mandates is going to be another cost or cost driver that we as a council need to figure out. Is, is that what you said? Right, or are there policy mechanisms to make sure, for example, that capacity revenue gets to those resources so that kind of market forces can help to keep them running? Just so I think there are, yeah, there are definitely different wedges for sure. The other thing is, um, has the ISO or the Public Service Commission been involved in this analysis and do they verify the, the inputs that have been put here by E3 and others? Um, I just want to know how much yeah, so, they Right, right. No, good question. So, so no, we haven't specifically brought the ISO into this re resolve modeling. What we did is we benchmarked it against work they've done and the power grid study where we were able to, to get direct feedback. Um, mm -hmm. But we do look forward to, to getting ISO feedback, you know, on kind of how the resolve and the recap cap modeling platform has played out. Um, so it's it's been more of a leveraging and benchmarking to the to other studies. Well, I just request that we get them involved. This is you know reliability is number one issue, and I'm not trying to question the quality of the analysis. It just makes me feel better that we know. Um, yeah, it's charged with reliability. Signs off on it. That's all. Yeah. No, thanks, 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 Carl. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Dennis Elsenbeck. Kevin, thanks. Uh, uh, great assessment. Um, one of the things that I, I asked and I've, I've been looking at uh, since we've started this is really more looking on the demand side of the electric system. I, I know we spend a lot of time on the supply side and, and, and it's important, but it's really 15% of our total greenhouse gases. Uh, the demand side is 85%. Uh, and, and Carl covered a lot of that today with transportation and buildings. So, so I never see enough of a viewpoint of how to look at uh, storage, and Bob mentioned thermal storage, but battery storage, and Rory mentioned this system viewpoint of, of things. Uh, and, and we talk about when we electrify our, our, our sectors, um, it's gonna increase electric demand. But if we think about it more of placing storage closer to where it is consumed, 
and, and then melding it with an electric option, a battery storage, and then the utilities movement towards AMI, it just seems to me we, you know, we, we need to focus a little bit more on how do I manage demand uh, as much as how am I managing my supply? Uh, am I missing mm -hmm. something? No, I think you're, you're right, Dennis, that flexible load is going to probably be something that everyone has on their top three list of kind of how, how are we going to solve this? Um, and maybe if I can go back to the opening premise of, you know, that it's only 15 percent of emissions, so are we focusing too much attention? I, I think part of the reason why we focus, maybe the majority of the reason why we focus is because of the growth of the grid over time, that it's going to be supplying 75 percent of our energy service needs. And so it's really more of a prospective forward look. How do we make sure the grid is operating well? How do we have flexible loads so we minimize cost? as opposed to a retrospective. So it's not so much worrying about what the grid was, but we need to put a lot of attention into what it needs to, to, to be, and we need to have a different view on that, right? And as you eloquently say, you know, we have to be looking at how demand is gonna change and, and how we're gonna activate all of that. Um, and so we are gonna be bringing forward some sensitivities around flexible load to show kind of, we did, I would say an aggressive case that we that we embedded in this scenario, but we think there are yet more aggressive ways that you can activate flexible load with, you know, traditional thinking around rate design, right? How do you stimulate that shifting of load around technologies for vehicle to grid and kind of uh, vehicle charging? You know, if you have a distribution network that can support charging, for example, at work, you may actually, when we're winter peaking and that peak is at 8 p.m., if you can actually do a little bit of charging at work during the day when the sun is shining, you know, so how do we think about smart infrastructure in a way that leverages the kind of latent flexibility and, and, and the latent capacity? So we do hope with the analytics to kind of tease that out, to tee it up for the scoping plan to then articulate what do we need to do with that information. And some of this, Carl, is, is the, as we discussed, is that, you know, Microgrids are, are, are a compelling uh, viewpoint on, you know, localized resiliency, um, engages the community, engages developers. And so instead of just looking at it from the point of view of, you know, what's the next order that we give to the utilities to upgrade this infrastructure because we have a changing uh, usage patterns because we're uh, electrifying our sectors, you know, there's a real opportunity, I think, of starting to focus uh, more and more on the demand side, because I think that's where we have the ability to manipulate load profiles uh, and, and optimize the transmission distribution system, just like any other product or service. Let's fill the lines up 24-7 to the degree we can and reward those who actually can do that and pull that off. Yeah, great. Thanks for that comment. Raya Salter. Hi, thank you. So interesting. Um, and actually, my question is it's similar perhaps to Dennis's in terms of like asking more about characteristics of the system. I agree 100%. We need to bring back our, you know, our smart grid and our reforming the energy vision analyses on rates and dynamic rates that as well. Um, also, you know, as we, we look at this and you're, you're talking about, you know, we expect as we're, you know, moving towards, you know, the, um, you know, offshore wind and beneficial electrification, you know, that these transmission upgrades, you know, and these distribution upgrades are going to, you know, facilitate interconnection improvements and facilitate um, local, um, small and local, locally owned renewables in particular, but not in exclusive to urban areas. So I guess my question is, can you kind of, is, does the analysis build in that way and that we think about, you know, okay, well, we know what will open up as we invest in, you know, over time in our transmission, in our distribution systems, and what will that, you know, an increase inter interconnection, and then what will that impact be on DER and locally owned um, renewables? And I'm thinking, um, I'm asking this in, in one one part because of, you know, thinking about the the study, the CLCPA requirement that we um, 
look at the barriers to local and community owned renewables. And we want to make sure that in this process that we're, you know, fostering those local in state renewables. Yeah. yeah. So. So there's a co optimization that the model does looking at storage, clean generation transmission. Um, it doesn't have the granularity to actually map each distribution system. Um, and so the solar you see is a combination of utility and distribution solar. I think 60 gigawatts should make it clear. There's a huge opportunity space here for both scales of solar. Um, and so what I, I guess what I hope it tees up, it doesn't have the specificity to really articulate, you know, specifically where distributed solar would be placed. Um, and therefore what the local distribution network upgrades might be. But what I think it gives us is the size of the prize. We have a massive amount of solar energy that we can harvest. And what we need to do think about through the next steps of the scoping plan is how do we control, how do we help to shape where those investments happen so that the opportunities for community ownership, you know, as articulated in the law, you know, can be made available. And then I think what flows from that is then feeding back into distribution system planning. Um, and so we have a proxy, you know, for kind of what that transmission and distribution upgrades would need to be, but it's really not specific enough to kind of create a roadmap that would then allow for us to think about ownership models. So really that's going to have to be follow on work, but I think it, it gives the sense of the size of the prize. Um, and that there's, there's, there's definitely just, it's going to be a big grid and we need to think about like, how do we minimize its growth? So to reduce costs, but then think about where the benefits of that both in terms of jobs and economic ownership, you know, how can that be, how will that play out over time? Um, and think about other different mechanisms that can steer it. Well, thank you so much. Donna DeCarolis. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I was just curious, as you think about sensitivities around all this, and as you look at uh, ways to solve for this growing um, winter peak, that, that the modeling is showing and, and how to best address it. Did we do any additional um, scenario testing or sensitivity testing around either a greater um, use of the strategic use of low carbon fuels? Because when you look at your at your peak uh, chart that goes with all those different scenarios, that, that was a lower um, peak scenario. And then I also wondered, was there any um, work done or considered um, relative to scaling up the um, the piece that has air source heat pumps with fuel backup. Again, that's another one that's been as a pathway um, identified in the New York City uh, study that was done by the mayor's office and Con Ed and Grid as a way to reduce winter peaks. So I was just curious if there was any, you know, uh, sensitivity around those um, pathways to try to reduce that peak. Yeah, and so um, and sorry, the second part of the question was to scale up air source heat pumps. Is that what was that the question? So the, the pathway, Carl, that has um, I'll call it dual fuel heating. So it's the air source okay. heat pump with the other fuel source to help reduce the, right. the coldest days. It, it mitigates the peak you'd otherwise have to hit. Yeah. So that definitely was one of the components of the scenario too. So you you know as I showed I think last time you know the the scenario two peak was substantially lower than the scenario three, and that was because of this ability to have strategic use of some dual fuels among other reasons, but that was one of the key drivers of differentiating factors. So that is baked into this scenario. Um, on the issue of the kind of looking at, at the grid and could the grid use even more RNG, um, what we're seeing is there's a substantial amount of either hydrogen or as I showed in that sensitivity um, on, on scenario three, where you could have RNG capacity and we're, we're going to need this firm zero emission resource. Um, and so the question is, you know, 20 gigawatts is a substantial amount. What we're finding though, is that the model is looking at the costs and, you know, we welcome feedback on those cost curves that we've put out there, but that the, the cost of the bioenergy is high enough that we see the model leaning into the cheap solar and wind as it can, adding storage as it can. And therefore there's actually a relatively small amount of fuel burn and it's because of the relative costs of the energy are driving uh, to not actually utilize that resource as, as much. Um, we need a lot of that capacity because you know, when we need it, we're gonna need it in those really cold winter days. Um, but just the, the uh, uh, relative cost structure is, is actually driving us to, to not burn that, that much of it. It's, it's a very precious resource that gives us incredible flexibility. 
um, and one that, you know, it, that the model is clearly cherishing in that using kind of a strategic amount of uh, small volumes, whether it be hydrogen, you know, that's being combusted or as we showed in that sensitivity, the, the, the RNG. Uh, I see that Gavin and Raya both had their hands up, but I'm not sure if those are legacy or if they have uh, additional questions. That's a legacy. The, the term legacy hand is from our Zoom era, I think. Right. Legacy. And Sarah, unless Gavin, you've got something pressing, maybe we should jump to the health um, so we can start to unpack some of that. It looks like the hand went down. So let's push on. So Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll let you go, um, and we'll be talking more soon about next steps. Okay, so health effects. Um, so what I've wanted to do is do um, a bit of a deep dive here. Again, I'm leveraging the kind of the uh, hard work and intellect of a really strong team across agencies, our, our consultant team digging into the literature. So I'll, I'll, I'll walk us through this at a high level. Um, we'll do some Q&A, and then we can do follow up for, for folks who want to go deeper. Uh, I guess I will give a spoiler alert that, you know, one of the things that I guess my intuition knew that this was going to be a finding, but it, it not surprised me at the magnitude because I don't live in the space as much. I've got staff who um, look carefully at the issue of uh, wood smoke and the health implications of it. We have programs that look at trying to address that. Um, I think one of the things we didn't quite as um, easily uh, kind of internalized was as we electrify and do energy efficiency, we will naturally be reducing wood smoke as well. Um, so it's a really important driver of health in the state. And so we have a lens just to kind of get your mind ready for it, kind of a with and without the impacts of reducing wood smoke, because it's such a big driver of PM emissions. Um, and it may be counterintuitive to some of you to kind of don't know the problem of wood smoke in our kind of rural communities. Um, but it's it's an important one that um, I know I've been working with my staff to help deal with and kind of uh, bend the curve on smoke. Um, but it's not one that probably gets as as much attention. So that's going to be one of the subplots here for you to put in your notes on the side. Okay, so some, taking a step back in terms of the health effects, just to reiterate what I've said maybe twice is we have these three really important large categories. Ambient air quality is typically the biggest. We use Cobra. Uh, we also modeled active transportation, um, which, you know, is includes the health benefits of walking and cycling, um, but it's, it's more than that. Um, it's looking at mass transit, getting people out of cars and some of the risks associated just purely with being in a car. Um, and we use this, this modeling platform of the integrated uh, transport health model. And then the last one, again, which was the more kind of digging into the literature, it's not a hard model that we have. It was more digging into the weatherization literature, some of the work of the national labs, looking at the energy efficiency uh, it, interventions. And, you know, part of that is, is, a, is avoiding of combustion in the home, but it's more than that. Um, it's about as you get a home that's healthier and safer, and, we, and we've broken down some of the categories, you'll, you'll see that there are substantial monetizable health benefits that are associated with the full suite of kind of home energy efficiency improvements. So next slide. So kind of to drive straight to the monetize breakdown, um, the COBRA tool intrinsically has a high low range. Um, and so we, we've kind of honored that and we recognize that in itself that was brought up, it doesn't include Toxics, it doesn't include ozone. Those are smaller um, smaller improvements as compared to focusing on the indirect and, and direct PM, but we think this range is a conservative range and even built into it, this, this high-low range gives you a sense of the, of the uncertainty in, um, uh, in some of the analysis. Um, just a couple of the key findings about the health benefits we, um, we experience are throughout the state. Um, and we also see some benefits of downwind of our state. We have to think about transport of these pollution um, outcomes. Um, most is in state, but we do see some benefit to our neighbors downwind, which is a good thing to them. Um, we see benefits of, of reduced fossil fuel consumption. So moving off of the wood smoke, but when we look at the fossil fuel consumption, we see the higher benefits in our urban areas. It shouldn't be surprising. We have concentration of combustion of, uh, of fossil fuels in our cities. 
Um, and so, you know, we have higher emissions and we have higher population. So the combination of those means we see a, a larger percentage of the non-wood smoke happening in our urban centers. Um, the uh, uh, benefits of reduced wood smoke are higher upstate. It shouldn't be surprising. That's where we burn more wood, although we do burn some downstate. Um, and then there's a substantial annual growth over time, right? So this is a cumulative impact. As we decarbonize, we're going to be having more electrification, more efficiency. Um, and so the health benefits are more backloaded. Um, and we just have an illustrative slide that shows how that grows over time. Um, and because of discounting, where we do a time value of money, we end up doing, we want to just show you explicitly what that discounting effect is. Um, so you can see that. Um, and then in the other categories, so our active transportation, it's a meaningful chunk. We're seeing $40 billion coming from that area itself. So it's not as big as ambient air, um, but it's a substantial contribution. And then the energy efficiency interventions, again, focused on the low moderate income percent of our homes in New York, which is a large number, um, but it's not the whole population by far, is, is 9 billion. So I think there it's conservative as well. We can see that will scale as we think about some of the other segments of our population. So that's the, that's the money. Um, next slide. So when we look at the total health benefit, this is just the same information, just you have it as kind of a stack up between the low value for the ambient and the high value on the right. Um, and so that's that, you know, that ranges therefore between 100 billion and, and, and 160 billion. Next slide. So let's now unpack each of those components. So the ambient air quality first. Next slide, please. So we talk about the dollars because that's how, you know, we think about it from a cold benefit cost analysis, but I think it's really important to think about the actual human impacts. And so what we're seeing from the air quality benefits are tens of thousands of premature tests avoided. So that gets to Bob's point. Uh, we are looking at the actual premature tests um, that we're avoiding, and that's tens of thousands through this work. We're looking at thousands of non-fatal heart attacks and hospitalizations. We're looking at thousands of asthma-related emergency visits. So these are, you know, kids and elderly folks living in New York City who won't be going to the hospital, and that's that's a cost to the hospital system, and that's a cost to to them personally. And we're looking at hundreds of thousands of lost workdays. So we're looking at greater productivity, which we can monetize, but it's also quality of life for, for people. Um, many of them, you know, many people aren't able to recoup those lost work days in terms of income. Um, and so this is, you know, many hundreds of thousands of work days that, that uh, won't be lost um, through these air quality improvements. Next slide, please. So when we look at isolating the ambient air quality benefits, we, we wanted to do it across both scenarios. So the two bars on the left um, show for the strategic low carbon fuels, and on the right, it's the accelerated low combustion. Um, and so we do see that there is a higher value on the right. Um, and what we looked at was when we broke it down, we wanted to be to show you where those benefits were coming from. So the light green and the orange are the largest slices. And you'll see that the light green is the benefit from reduced wood combustion upstate. So we see a substantial health benefit from the energy efficiency work we're doing and the electrification that we're doing. Um, and a lot of that is upstate. And then the other large chunk is the benefit from, from uh, re reduce of, of combustion of fossil fuels downstate. Um, and then some of the smaller wedges, you see there, that there is a tiny slice um, that's from outside New York. Um, so it's, it's not really part of our core narrative, but it's, it's nice to, to note that the downwind communities also benefit. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just a quick one, again, just to give you a sense of kind of what does the discounting and time value of money do. So you'll see that these benefits grow over time um, and that when we discount to that present value, which we're doing across all the benefits and cost streams, this just gives you a sense of how a benefit that's more backloaded gets more heavily discounted when we look at a, a net present value. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so sectoral level analysis. I want to be able to, to un, un, unpack it a bit um, so that we can understand. Um, so next slide, please. So first I want to level set, um, like I did with the greenhouse gas emissions, and um, I want to be able to say, okay, where are the emissions coming from? So we took our kind of near-term uh, uh, snapshot from our reference case, and 
really wanted to level set on both NOx and PM to, to kind of think about where it's coming from, because that's going to show mostly where it's also going to come from. Um, you know, I also want to honor the fact that this is, this is an annual snapshot. It's not how air regulators always or tend to look, right? We tend to think about seasons. We tend to think about, you know, for ozone creation, it's, you know, certain summer days and certain summer seasons. Um, it's very complex modeling that our colleagues do to develop a state implementation plan to look at mitigating these. Um, and so um, kind of want to own up front that this, this summary is only a piece of the narrative. And if you want to kind of dive deeper, we would need to kind of unpack again how we do ambient air quality modeling and do the regulation of those sources. So when we look at the PM emissions, um, maybe surprising to some that a lot of the PM emissions actually come from non-combustion sources. So you can think of everything from road dust and transportation um, to aerosols that are coming from other products, not from energy. Um, but there is a meaningful amount that does come from combustion. And when we unpack that statewide, we see in these dashed lines that that's all the combustion from industry and from residential and commercial wood. So it's not that we're burning a lot of wood, it's that it's very dirty when it is burned. Um, and, you know, I think partly the disproportionate share it now owns is because we've actually done a fairly good job through strategic work federally and even, you know, state and local to, to get the emissions out of conventional fuels. So we've taken the sulfur out of diesel and out of home heating oil. Huge improvements to air quality came from that. We've seen uh, New York City's local law moving from six, um, number six oil, which is heavy, dirty oil. Um, these have had dramatic improvements from those policies and we need to kind of honor those um, and say that we need to go deeper um, but what it means is that, you know, when we look at the inventory, wood smoke um, right now is, is a large source. And then we see as, this, as the secondary large sources of PM are transportation. So it's both on-road and non-road. So that's that yellow and that green. Um, so when we think about in-city combustion of fuels and, and what do we want to go after, it's going after clean transportation, right? It's getting people out of cars and it's getting people into electric vehicles. Um, and the EGU is just the, uh, um, the uh, term of art for an, an electric generating unit. And so we'll see that they actually produce very little of our overall PM. Next slide. Um, so the, the uh, NOx story is kind of the opposite side of the Pac-Man. Um, and so most of the NOx actually comes from combustion and it's much more diverse. Um, and so what we see here is that there's actually, you know, there's very little NOx that's directly coming from wood combustion. Um, a large percentage is coming from residential fuel combustion. So this is, you know, burning oil in our homes, um, burning gas in our homes, um, which are less controlled than our EGUs. Um, and then we see obviously that on-road also produces quite a bit of NOx. Now we have um, a fair amount of controls on those vehicles. Um, we have, you know, over many years, you know, from the early days of smog, uh, choking the Los Angeles population um, and some of the kind of early Clean Air Act work. Um, we've done an amazing job at making what, um, what can be uh, partial zero emission vehicles and we think about NOx. Um, so we have, in, in, we have incredible technology on our vehicles now, um, but obviously there's uh, space there to, to uh, further improve and to go to zero emission. And then we see that our electric generators, our EGUs are also there. So they're uh, a, a more measurable part of NOx, which is why we have our new NOx regs that are coming into force to really uh, re reduce those uh, uh, NOx emissions. Um, but again, if we wanna think about what we wanna go after, um, we need to think about the on-road fleet for the NOx and for the in-building fuel combustion. Next slide. Okay, um, so when we think about health benefits, we've now taken, so I tried to level set for you on kind of where are the emissions coming from? What's our kind of annual inventory? Um, and then let's think about what are the benefits that we realize? And so what we plucked out were the benefits from the accelerated uh, transition away from combustion. Um, it was similar from our scenario two, but we wanted to focus in on, on, on scenario three, which is really focusing us on this, this air quality. And so what we realize here is that not surprisingly, most of the health benefits come from the, re the reduction in the wood smoke and from our on-road and our non-road. 
Um, and so we do realize benefits from our electric generation and, and uh, shrinking some of those emissions. But I think it's important as we think about health benefits and think about where we wanna go, we need to be really focused from this analysis, like these policies that are driving a transformation in our transportation system. And again, in the electrifying of buildings and energy efficiency in buildings, we're able to reduce our wood smoke and able to reduce our diesel and our gasoline emission. Uh, next slide, please. So now I wanna get at the uh, actual maps. Um, and so this is what we were asked about. And so again, just to kind of warm up the brains, we're first gonna show total. And what we see there, as I said in the key findings, it's broad statewide benefits that we realize from all of these policies. It's not just concentrated. Um, only in the communities that have been exposed to diesel emissions. Um, but then we look at, if we take the lens and take off wood smoke, we can see how it, it, we do see specific benefits in some of those communities um, where we have urban environment. So uh, let's orient on what the graphic looks like here. So this is the per capita health benefit. Um, so why, why we do it on a per capita basis is we wanna normalize so that it isn't just where all the people are. Um, and so obviously if we looked at the health benefit um, on a non per capita basis, New York City would just, you know, take over the world in terms of kind of how, how it looks on the map. So this is our scenario two. And what we see here is that when we look at, again, all the health benefits, you see that the darker blue is where we see more health benefits per capita. And it is focused around urban environments. So we see Buffalo, Rochester, we're seeing it. You know, New York City is dark blue. If you, see, if you squint your eyes, you can see that we're, we're getting some significant health benefits there. Um, we're also though seeing broad swaths of counties that are gonna realize health benefits. So our rural communities that are being exposed to that wood smoke and to a lesser degree, some of the oil combustion products will be significantly benefiting from these policies. So this, is a, this isn't just an inner city issue. This is health benefits for everyone in the state. Um, next slide. And oh, so this is our scenario three. Sorry, I think I had both scenarios. So it's a similar story. Sorry, let, let, let's go back. Um, so you can see that our, 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 our scenario three, you see slightly darker blues, um, but with the wood smoke, you see relatively uh, similar outcomes. Um, so it gets a little more interesting. So next slide, we take off our uh, wood smoke layer. And so now when we look at the PM emissions that are predominantly around fossil, you can see that the city and Long Island stay very dark blue. Um, and we still see kind of widespread benefits, but they tend to be more around urban areas and uh, transportation corridors. Um, and so, um, you know, again, you know, we, we can be able to, to zoom in county by county and we can be, begin to kind of unpack. And I hope it begins to give us insights as we layer in our, our, our disadvantage communities lens, which again is kind of census block. So we'll need to start thinking about where do we see disadvantage communities and higher concentrations and being able to kind of layer on that view with this county level view. Um, and then the next slide, you can see that when we go to the, the scenario three, certain counties pop up as being brighter. And so what we realize by burning less fuel as part of our scenario three, we're gonna be seeing meaningful impacts and you know, when you look at it statewide, it's a, it's a little bit less clear, but you can see that at certain counties where we have more concentration of some of those re, re, remaining sources of combustion, we see that we get some, some newer benefits. So that's a look at the per capita health benefits. If we go to the next slide, we wanna look at CO2 concentrations. So again, these are the things that are driving those health benefits. So I thought it'd be useful to kind of see what's what's kind of the key source for those. So next slide, um, when we look at wood smoke, you can see, you know, when we look at the entire um, range, so that's avoiding fossil fuel combustion, but also avoiding uh, wood smoke, you can see that we've got um, deep re re reductions of PM, again, throughout the whole state. We see some focus around cities, um, but we also see it throughout kind of our Southern tier and the, uh, and the central part of the state. Um, and so this is for our strategic low carbon fuel. And what we did here was a snapshot in 2050. So this is kind of our end state to show you what the PM, the deep levels of, of drop of PM reductions. And you'll see that the downwind state, you know, Massachusetts, Vermont, they do benefit because right now they're breathing our bad air. 
right? Um, and so, you know, this isn't, when you think about transport and you're thinking about the impact on the kind of, on, on our region, we today have a regional impact from our emissions and we will also have regional benefits. Uh, next slide. And so when we look at, did we skip one? No, I guess we, we were focusing on low carbon. So now when you take off the, the layer of, of, of wood smoke, you can see that the PM concentrations are clearly heavily focused around our urban centers. And so you've got that, that dark green in New York City and Long Island. Part of why Long Island is dark green is because it's downwind of New York City. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's gaining in the re reductions as we decarbonize the, the, the city and we, re and we remove those uh, combustion sources. You also see some of the communities north of New York City benefit. So again, that's partly because they themselves are reducing combustion, but they're also benefiting from the, the, the reduction of the concentration of, of the energy use. Um, so I, I think part of the dichotomy here or thing to own is that when we reduce diesel emissions, right, which is some of our major on-road and off-road, Certainly there are those local communities that are gonna benefit from not having those diesel emissions you know, near their schools, but it's not just about those disadvantaged communities that may have those you know, Hunts Point depots where you have huge amounts of PM from those diesel trucks, but it's also those communities that uh, surround it and that are downwind of it. Um, and so I think you know, we need, when we think about disadvantaged communities, it's really important obviously for us to look at the narrative and focus the resources and the benefit. Um, but when you've got a vehicle that's rolling through streets, it's going to be many neighborhoods who are gonna benefit when we electrify those vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so that's it for the ambient. I have just a couple slides on the others. I, I did wanna focus on some of the mapping because that's where we've been able to do really granular modeling. So active transportation, we'll flip slide there. Um, and I'll try to move quickly because I wanna leave time for the end. So um, this integrated transport health impacts model, um, you know, we look at active modes of transportation. Um, we, it's kind of scaling down of US level data because that's where the kind of core modeling is. Um, and what we look at is we customize it for New York based on our VMT reduction and the mode shifting that we've modeling. Um, the output is net changes in number of deaths, including decreases in deaths from physical activity. So people are healthier through, by having physical activity, but as well as avoiding traffic collisions. Um, and next slide, piece. So we just have a, 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 a simple growth over time. So the net present value is 40 billion. It does emphasize it's backloaded, right? As we transform our system over time, it's gonna take time for us to have healthier roads and communities. Um, and so again, when we think about how we're discounting those, our discounting occurs more for things that are more backloaded. Um, so just we wanna make sure that when we think about net present value, um, it, it does put a, a weight on kind of some of the more front loaded costs that will be realizing benefits in those later years. Next slide. So energy efficiency and health effects, next slide. So here there were predominantly a few sources of, of literature. So there wasn't an actual model that we were using. Um, so there's been some historical look at the weatherization assistance, so the uh, WAP programs. Oak Ridge National Lab did a really comprehensive evaluation back in 2014. These are federal programs that are implemented by state and local jurisdictions, but the federal government has kind of long and deep uh, history of, of data there. Um, ACEEE, which is our energy efficiency federal nonprofit, um, they've done some really comprehensive looking more, more recently at, at the literature around this. And then more recently, Oak Ridge has kind of taken that data set um, and we were able to look at some of their specific looking at, um, at multifamily homes. Of course, we were really interested in that because you know, if you look um, at our building stock, we have a lot of multifamily homes in, in New York. Um, and so that, that was an important area for, for us to be able to drill a little bit deeper. Um, and so again, we're focusing because that's where the literature is on low and, and moderate income homes. Um, I think it also aligns with some of our thinking around did, did, uh, disadvantaged um, com com communities. So this is a nice lens to be able to put towards our, kind of to be able to look at a proxy for our decks. Um, and so this is just some of the definitions around, around what LMI is um, in this literature and then how we applied it to, to, to the homes in New York. So next slide um, gives a little bit of a 
breakdown of what we're seeing. Um, so the dominant sources of the monetized benefits are reduced asthma incidents at home. So this is not from ambient air quality, but truly from the indoor environment getting better. Um, so again, you know, folks who are living in homes who are going to breathe better and have fewer symptoms and and and, and, and overall incidence of asthma. The other big one here is the reduced uh, thermal stress. So when we think about healthy homes and well insulated homes um, and homes that are kind of better heated more uniformly, that's both cold and heat stress. And so there's a there's a resiliency layer there, but it's also just having healthier homes. And if we can have more efficient, tighter homes that can have the proper air exchange, we can realize billions of dollars of uh, health benefit from that. So next slide. Um, so maybe just um, in terms of time, this is the kind of the linear trajectory over time. It grows. You'll see that scenario three has a bump up when we accelerate our overall uh, um, electrification and energy efficiency in homes. But they they kind of again because. Each sister scenario is doing deep energy efficiency. We are realizing these significant health benefits in, in both. Next slide. So just in the interest of time, I'm just going to do I only have one slide on, on the carbon pricing. I'm going to bang through that. I'll be done talking and then we can take a step back and do some Q&A around all of it. Um, so we are still looking and digging into the carbon pricing analysis. Um, we've, we've explored the kinds of tools that we would need to do. Um, it's clear to us that the key questions that we think come out of carbon pricing analysis um, and what we hope to look at an, an economy-wide carbon price, which would be our initial focus, would be looking at gross state product and the uh, demand of labor, how that shifts under carbon pricing. Obviously, we want to look at what greenhouse gas emission benefits we would realize by the consumer response to those prices. Um, so that's separate from how they would be invested in the policies that we've already talked about. We want to look at what is the intrinsic GHG reduction that comes from the pricing policy itself. Um, we need to look at total energy expenditures in, in different sectors, right? We need to be able to think about if the carbon pricing has disproportionate impacts on different parts of our economy. We need to look at the economic impact on different income groups. So that's about energy justice um, on, you know, and think about are there different segments of our economy that might be impacted? And then if they are, how does, how does the actual carbon pricing need to be shaped so that it's not a, a, a regressive pricing program. Um, and then finally, we need to think hard and fast about economic and emissions leakage. Like if New York moves forward with a carbon price and other parts of the U.S. economy don't, um, we need to understand what that leakage risk is. So when we look at those key research questions in the literature and what studies have done, they looked at it in Washington. Colorado, there's been a really great set of studies in, in Vermont. Actually, they looked at carbon pricing. We've been looking at those. We, we realized we're going to need to have a, a dynamic macroeconomic model. Um, so that's really, in order to get at some of these key issues, it needs to be a, um, a, a multi-regional model. And the kind of state of the art are, are computable general equilibrium models. Um, and so those are labeled to be dynamic. And then what they look at is how price evolves and the, and the economic activity evolves around those prices. And obviously we need to have something that can isolate New York. There aren't a lot of models that do that, but also comprehensively look at trade so we can think about economic leakage. Um, in order to look at the energy system, it's gonna have to have a detailed view of the energy system itself. We need to be able to look at the supply of energy from our secondary goods. So looking at you know, the, the refined products that we import into the state, the natural gas that we distribute and import into the state. Uh, we need to look at the demand of fuels by sector in order to really look at are there disproportionate impacts across the different sectors. And then obviously we have to, for the grid, which is going to be growing, we have to actually have at least at some level of a proxy what the distinct generation units are. So this is a, quite an ask. There are not few models that off-the-shelf do this. We, we think we have found a, a, a couple that can answer those that question. So we're actively working with those entities that can do this work, and there aren't many, to figure out how can we at least do some screening analysis this fall. Um, but we really think it's going to be a start of the conversation. Um, so what I hope to do is come back to you next month and be able to share some of what we found, both kind of the, the, the methods, you know, who can do the work for us. This is not work that E3 can do. This is not work that the consultants, and we have a team of consultants working on the Just Transition Working Group. This is more advanced tools than what we have in our quiver of, of many consultants. Um, so this is a 
progress report that we are articulating what the need is, what the need of the models are, and we and we have a line of sight, we, we think, but we just need to um, go a little bit further to kind of bring, bring forward this work. Um, so we're working as fast as we can. Uh, we recognize the, the, um, the importance of this, and I think what I'll, you know, just say straight up is whatever work we can accomplish this fall will have to be just our starting point. Um, so sorry to mix and match here a little bit of the health and the carbon pricing, but I do want to try to close out with time for questions. Um, so I think I'm done. We can go next slide and pause there to open up the mic. We've got uh, Rory Christian first with his hands up. Okay, Rory, thanks. Apologies, that and is a might... legacy band. <laughs> okay. We'll go to uh, Henry Sleetoff then. Okay, yeah, Great. I, I uh, Carl, I just wanted to compliment you and your team on this work. I wanted to see this kind of analysis done in energy planning for more than a decade. So it's really great to see it in, in place here now and, and all the hard work you've done. I know it's a ton of work. Um, and not only did you do the air quality analysis, but also the active transport and the uh, housing weatherization. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that although, you know, these numbers, the health benefits estimates are really large. I mean, uh, on the scale of and even higher than the cost, um, they may even be conservative or there's reason to believe that they may be conservative, as you, as you pointed out, um, the toxics and the ozone isn't accounted for, even though they may be smaller um, than the PM, they're still significant. Um, and then there's other fairly more conservative uh, assumptions. Uh, for example, you only looked at the low and moderate income housing weatherization benefits, and there could be other benefits for other income groups. Um, and then there are lots of other health-related impacts associated with fossil fuel use, like spills into uh, groundwater and contamination and, 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 and myriad uh, impacts that aren't easy to account for. So I just wanted to point out that although the impacts the benefits are large, they, um, they may even be conservative. And it would be great to see this kind of modeling done more in the future and refined further. So that's all I want to say. Interesting, also interesting uh, Interesting that the wood smoke impact is so large and that may be challenging to um, curb wood smoke combustion energy. But interesting, so thank you. Great. Yeah, no, thank you, Henry. And, and also, I mean, I want to thank your team um, and the leadership that, you know, you all have put forward. I mean, I think because you have championed this issue, it made it into the law, and it means that we're going to be putting more and more resources towards analyzing this. And I, and I wholeheartedly agree that what we're looking at here is I think it's the low bar. You know, I, I think we intrinsically are conservative when we do model these because we're only taking a, kind of one view of the beast. Um, and so I, 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 I hope that we can realize that it's meaningful and that it will only go up as our science gets better. Yes. Thank you. Bob Howard. Thank you, Sarah, and, and, and thank you again, Carl. Uh, you must be tired. <laughs> you presented an incredible amount of material today, and it's, 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 it's all really great. Uh, actually, I want to, I want to make a comment to. To my colleagues on the council and to the leadership of the council, not so much directed at you, but I appreciate your final statement there, saying that trying to get at the carbon pricing with existing models is is really really tough. You know, I'm one of the people who who asked for that. I understand it's it's tough. Uh, you know, given that we have to have an implementation draft plan done in what two and a half months, probably two months really. I think the council needs to find a way to discuss, debate how we move ahead with things like. Do we want to have a carbon fee? How would how would it be applied? What what would that mean? I mean, you, the analysis you've presented is is incredible. We we need to move to this pathway. The technologies are there. Uh, the funding mechanisms are not so clear, right? And the, and the policies behind that. And so you know, I, I really think that that's a major part of our job. And I I think we need to find some time to do that as a major priority over over the next month or two. And and let me just throw out a couple of possibilities. Our our, our advisory panels have talked about this, and some have uh, suggested specific uh, 
carbon fees, say for the electric sector or elsewhere, we should debate. You know, does it make sense to have a carbon fee just in the electric sector? Should we have a carbon fee that's uniform across all all fossil sources? You know, perhaps uh, we shouldn't worry about the transportation sector because it's going ahead in other ways. Maybe we do something like a a hybrid approach where we uh, put a carbon fee on the on the use of fossil fuels in in buildings for heating because that's still a challenge and it's a mechanism to move ahead there and the transportation sector we do something else we say propose a tax on the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles until we transition to 100 percent renewables uh maybe for light vehicles we do that for heavy vehicles we don't want to move them out of state maybe we increase uh, toll taxes on on heavy vehicles i mean i think there are a bunch of things out there we could do and that's I've, I've heard a lot of background conversation about all of this, but I think we need to bring it to the front in the in the council. So that's not directed at you at all, Carl. I think what you've done is great, but I, I think we need to step up to the challenge and what we need to do and talk about those uh, some of the funding mechanisms, other mechanisms. I mean, another way to approach the the funding of, of heat pumps is to uh, find loan policies, maybe funded by the uh, utilities, maybe by other sources, the payback period for anyone to do a, a, a conversion to heat pumps in an existing construction is it's probably under 10 years. It's under five years, might be 15 years in a worst case scenario. It's in the homeowner's interest, but they don't have the upfront capital, right? And so finding those mechanisms, I, I think we have to, to really come to grips and put some of that into our plan in the next uh, two months. So, but thank you for your work and uh, Thank you to my colleagues for listening to me. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, let Carl get a drink of water, maybe, um, and and say that you're right where we need to be, which is you know now we have a I think a very strong articulation of what, and and we're starting to look at the trade offs between various mm -hmm. pathways to get us from here to there, and then then we need to be thinking about how, right? That's one of the major objectives in 2022 is to, to start looking at the mechanisms to, to achieve those pathways. So I think the scoping plan could and should should uh, tee all of these issues up um, for full deliberation in 22, for sure. But thank you for that. And I just, you know, just to re-articulate that, Although I'd asked for this more detailed analysis from Carl and his group, I, I recognize it. It's it's very difficult, and it's not going to come in time to help us in the immediate future. And I I don't think we should use that as an excuse not to move ahead with our debate. Yeah, no, good point. I do I do think um, Carl, did you speak to timeline at all? I suppose perhaps we should. I mean, I do think we'll have some indications to inform our twenty twenty two deliberations. I think that's where we're. It's as he, as he said, it's not, it's not going to be complete or the end, but I think it'll, it'll give us some directional information. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's what we're aiming for. Um, but I also want to honor, I think, Bob, what you said is analysis paralysis is kind of what's got us to where we are today in some part, right? Like we've admired the problem. For decades, um, and let's, let's not allow additional. Quandaries around either false precision or kind of we need to dig deeper to stop us from thinking about solutions. Yeah, as a research scientist, I agree totally. You know, it's, can always do more research, and that's what my life is about. But there's a time to move. Thank so you. maybe Bob um, and the rest of the council, let us take that request and that really good suggestion, uh, which I agree is an important one, uh, compared to the calendar, and come back to you all. With a suggestion on on how we'd have that debate, um, agree. We need to fit all that into the scoping plan, um, and we have a we have a packed schedule, but it is important. Ryan Salter. Oh, thank you so much again. Tremendous. So much. So much was presented. Um, first, just maybe a comment that it's fascinating on the health piece that. It, you know, where the more we dig in to what these health benefits are, it, you know, a lot of the, you know, the narrative has, has been with these things is like, if we reduce overall emissions, it will also help, you know, disadvantage communities. And as we sort of unpack and dig into the science and, and analyze it more, I think we see 
we're seeing again and again the sort of the reasoning of early action on prioritizing these emissions and co-pollutant um, reductions in disadvantaged communities is is really really important for for everyone. Um, and then yes, to um, I was actually that's going to be my questions in terms of like the timing of our carbon pricing analysis and opportunity for iteration. I saw you've got some great principles in terms of you know what will the impacts of these policies be. Interested if you thought about. Uh, what the impacts will be in terms of, you know, distribution of proceeds, you know, in terms of, you know, the prioritizing them or going into, you know, how they can feed into, you know, getting the, the clean energy and other impacts that, that we like. So I. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think what we've articulated today is like where we need to invest. And so I, I guess I, I'm thinking that it's, it will be for the council to kind of think through if there's. I would think when we analyze, we're going to look at more than one scenario around a carbon price. And so we'll see what the magnitude of that proceed would be over time. Um, and then for, for the council to discuss, how might that be prioritized? I mean, if there are certain groups that are disproportionately impacted by the price itself, is there a mechanism to manage that? When we look at the levels of investment, we see that, you know, there are substantial buildings is needing, you know, just from the kind of cold, hard numbers is needing probably the kind of the largest um, volume of funds, but certainly transportation is, is kind of next up in terms of thinking about infrastructure for that. Um, so I guess what I hope the analysis will drive is insights into kind of where we need to dig for the gold um, in terms of going after emissions. But the prioritization, that kind of normative question to me is exactly, I think, where the council should be debating. Thank you for that. And I look forward to, you know, as we like think in the next couple of months, like what, what the tools will be, what's going to be looked at, what will the scope be some opportunities for iteration there. Sounds like that's where we're yeah. moving. Absolutely. And I, I think it's a conversation like this isn't going to be a uh, once and done. This is a very complex piece of work that only a few people in the country can do well. Um, and it's 1 that we need to iterate on. Just you. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Dennis Elsenbeck. Thank you. Um, Carl, one of the, what struck me on these, uh, the last, uh, the, the whole discussion on health uh, brought me back to conversations I've had with a few of the solar developers over the year that, you know, have looked at, uh, you know, developments and in municipalities across New York State in terms of putting in, uh, you know, solar farms or wind farms, et cetera. Um, but there's a different governance structure uh, in municipalities. Uh, they own their own electric system in terms of local distribution. Uh, the power authority owns the, the transmission or the sub transmission that goes into that. Uh, but the more I look at, you know, kind of like, you know, our goals and the aggressive nature of the goals, um, a lot of the development, according to these developers, don't occur in the municipalities because they don't have the same incentives that you can get through NYSERDA or others. You know, have we have we started to explore, maybe taking that step back and say, well, how do we engage, you know, th this different governance process, uh, but then you know, kind of provide more incentives so that they're actively engaged in it, as opposed to being this, you know, entity that's not participating in the in this broader uh, goal that we're all uh, all trying to figure out as an implementation team here. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to think about how to best articulate. So can, is there a, can you just one, one more time, just kind of with the focused question, Dennis, just to help me out. What's the, what's, what, what's the kernel there? So the, we have a number of municipalities. you know what a municipality yeah. is, right? Carl, uh, they're, they're, yeah. they're basically scattered around the, they have hydro allocations. Um, the, the point I'm trying to make is, is are we looking at the same trying to figure out the same level of processes, programs, and incentives that we give to those developers that hook up or interconnect with utilities, IOUs, can we get to the same level with municipalities 
so that we actually have more access to more infrastructure and spread those mm -hmm. costs even further. So it makes more yeah, sense. Yeah, no, I think Sorry. it's a great suggestion. Yeah, I think it's a great suggestion. I think we need to build that into the scoping plan for sure. I don't know that that level of granularity is something we would explicitly model, but I think it's 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 a great idea that should go into the scoping plan. Thanks, Carl. Yeah. And the last question I see is from uh, Gavin Donahue. Um, it's more of a, a comment, and, and I agree with Rhea and everybody else today. There's tons of stuff out here to think about. And I, and I sort of want to kick back to Bob's comment about carbon pricing. Um, and Carl, this is not a criticism. I don't want you to take this mm -hmm. the wrong way. But every time I ask the question today about cost impact, how did he deal with existing renewables, whether carbon, Bob asked about carbon pricing, I asked about carbon pricing. Carl's answer to me and the rest of us is, well, the council is gonna have to determine that. I don't know how this group is gonna determine that. We don't have staff, we don't have analysis. We're supposed to put a scoping plan out in two months. If you don't have the critical components about cost and how to pay for this stuff, whether it, you know, the question Carl was about existing renewables and your answer to me was, well, the council needs to figure that out. And I respect your answer, Carl, please take it the right way. But I'm sitting mm -hmm. as a council member saying, well, how am I gonna make decisions that are important decisions about cost, reliability, the future energy system of the state when we get answers that, well, the council has to figure that out. And we, we have Sarah Osgood who does a great job, but we, we don't have the mechanisms to make these decisions. And I don't, I, you know, I don't expect an answer. I just asked Doreen and Basil, take that back, think about it. How are we going to make these judgment calls when we, I don't think it's the right answer to say the council has to figure it out because I don't think we have the, the expertise to figure it out. It'll come up with worthwhile recommendations and, you know, that, that's just a thought I wanted to leave everybody with because I'm concerned that we're not going to have the resources on the dollars and cents side of this and, and that's really important. So, thanks for listening. Yeah, no, thank you, Gavin. Great. Well, um, yes, thanks for the input, put Gavin, certainly um, happy to, to continue to probe on that topic. And also, I, I, I just, as we transition into our last topic, I just have to reiterate our sincere thanks to, to Carl, to you and the entire team. Um, really, really well done. And, and a huge milestone that we've received and reviewed today. I mean, this is the first time for all of us that makes clear the scale of the needed investment to achieve the Climate Act goals. So what I take from this is it's going to fundamentally require action across all sectors within our society, hands down, public and private, local, federal, and of course state. So I hope we're each walking away with a broader understanding of what it will take to achieve these goals um, as we head toward the issuance of the draft scoping plan um, by the first of, of next year. So, as we pivot to that topic, um, certainly hey, the staff. Sorry, Doreen, I just had a, I had a hand up here and if oh. it's okay before you pivot, I'll, I'll be brief, but I, I just, I, uh, you know, I, in defense of Carl and his team and, and maybe a slight pushback to Gavin's comment just now, I, I walk away from this meeting having a real good sense of the benefits that are out there, who lives, who dies, what are the real, you know, accrued benefits of, of our approach and also, uh, you know, an understanding of the different scenarios and costs. Um, what I th think maybe Gavin, you were saying is we haven't really hashed out how we're gonna pay for it um, and, and ensure that as we move forward, this just ends just and it's done equitably and nobody's left behind in, re in, in those pay for it scenarios. But I, I, I just feel, and, and I just wanted the moment not to go by that, you know, I think we do have a real good sense of, you know, where the costs are, what are the ranges are, and what are the significant benefits. It's for me, it's just how do we pay for it as a state? All set, Peter. Okay. So, where was I? Um, so, I was pivoting to the point of, of where we we're going next with respect to the draft scoping plan. Um, I'd like to, to say that it is true that in, in parallel with the work that you've just been presenting, presented with, that the staff team certainly has been working hard to pull the materials that have become, that have come before the council into a comprehensive scoping plan. 
that addresses many of the topics that we have covered today. So as we wrap up this evening, um, Sarah is going to give us a brief walkthrough of the initial draft scoping plan as a means to orient all the members as to the initial draft, which you will be receiving shortly. So Sarah. Thanks, Doreen. Um, and just being cognizant of time, I'll probably go through these fairly quickly, but um, they will be in the, the presentation that's posted online. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Just want to start with uh, an overview of the organization of the report, and then I'll just do, I was going to do a deep dive into, into select sections, but I'll do a little bit of a lighter touch there, but we'll still hit on some of the important pieces. So um, we have six main sections to the initial draft scoping plan that's under development. Those are highlighted in yellow here, and you can see that the, uh, the language underneath each of these kind of tries to give a little bit of a sense of what is in each of those sections. So, you know, overview kind of provides a bit of the background, why we're, why we're needing to take this action, the pillars of New York's plan to realize net zero emissions, is really focusing on the objectives of the scoping plan and highlighting some of the overarching uh, themes that um, are, are critical to our work. So climate justice, just transition, and, and some of the health outcomes. The evaluation of the plan section will be largely the integration analysis work that has been, as well as the health analyses that, um, that Carl has been walking us through here for um, the past couple months. Um, then we get into sector strategies, which will be, um, we're starting with the advisory panel recommendations that were put forward and then adding on the additional strategies or components that were identified through the integration analysis. Um, those sectors, uh, the sector strategy section is broken down um, in chapters by, by sector. Uh, then we get into some statewide and cross-sector policies. Um, these are obviously more cross-cutting, um, and so things like carbon pricing options, the gas system transition, partnering with local government, and adaptation and resiliency are, um, are the key topics there. And then we close with uh, measuring success, where we talk about the importance of partnerships uh, across various levels of, of government jurisdictions um, and other essential elements for, for success. Um, and so I will say where um, I just want to kind of map to, to some degree where um, you'll see some of the recommendations that had come from the advisory panel and working groups. So the, uh, the pillars of New York's plan, um, the just transition section does have uh, some recommendations that largely come from the just transition group, but also um, other workforce related recommendations from the other um, from the other uh, panel. Um, obviously, the the sector strategy section is where we're going to see most of the uh, of the recommendations. And so, if we could just advance to, um, I think it's slide 94. It, um, it's a mapping one. One more. There we go. And so this, while being kind of a, a little bit of a complicated map, it's really intended to show how the greenhouse gas emissions categories relate to the advisory panels and then how the recommendations from the advisory panels are working their way into the scoping plan. And so you'll see that um, we've been working uh, to streamline the organization of the recommendations to, to some extent, and that's how we've uh, arrived at the, at the chapter shown here. I will point out that smart growth, while certainly important, um, is not in its own chapter. We've got that um, largely in the land use chapter, but would also show up to some extent in the transportation chapter. If we could go to the next slide, um, I'll, just, I'll just do one example from the, the, the sector strategy section to show you um, generally what we're trying to, to show there. Um, each of the chapters in this section have a similar format. It has an overview of the sector, which includes the current state of the sector and vision for 2030 and 2050. We've got the existing mitigation strategies that are already uh, in place. And then, um, and then we get into the key sector strategies, which 
are largely, in most cases, in most chapters, are divided into themes, not consistently, but um, where we had um, basically a long list of strategies, we wanted to help provide a little bit of, of structure there, and so we've organized it into themes. Um, where we do have um, uh, the strategies listed, we also have the components of the strategies as uh, similar to how the advisory panels had reported out to the Climate Action Council earlier this year. And also in discussing the strategies within, um, within this section, we know the specific feedback that's, that's been received from, from the Climate Justice Working Group and how that's being incorporated. So I won't go through the rest of the slides that um, go kind of sector by sector, just, just show some of the, you know, kind of the main, the vision, and then what the themes and strategies are. Um, but perhaps um, it would be helpful if we go to the next step slide. Um, and um, probably something worth, in, uh, worth mentioning, the document, the, the draft scoping plan will have a number of technical appendices as well. Um, and that's where a lot of uh, some of the more detailed analysis will go. Um, but just looking at the, the next steps through the end of the year, which um, will take back how we can fit back, how we can fit in additional conversations um, that, that were requested today. But uh, the plan is to take uh, the information that was presented here today, largely from the integration and, and health analyses, work that material into the initial draft scoping plan and to provide a uh, draft version to you uh, as council members by the end of October. Um, we'll, we'd have some uh, small group sessions to gather feedback on the plan um, the first half of November. Um, and then we'd come back at the November 16th meeting. We'd have a report out on the job study. We'd also uh, hear again from Carl on the remaining analyses. And um, when we'd review and discuss any feedback that we've received at that point in time and, and what the plan is for resolution. Uh, then the plan is to, uh, based on the conversation at that meeting, to turn around a revised draft scoping plan to the CAC members that um, we'd hope would satisfy um, uh, the, the request or the, the feedback that you'd provided um, earlier in November. And then um, our December 13th meeting would be a discussion and presentation of what those changes were and, um, and then potential action on the draft scoping plan. And so this is, um, sorry, it's a, I know I'm kind of running through this quite quickly, but this is the same schedule as, um, as I communicated at the last meeting, so no big changes here. Um, but as I said, we will take back and um, take the schedule back and see if there's ways to work in some of the additional um, items that were requested today. Um, I do see that we're over time, but um, if there are any, I, I don't know, Doreen, if you, uh, Doreen and Basil, if you if you want to take any questions or um, at this point, um, there are a few hands up. I don't know if those are so-called legacy hands. Um, in interest of time, and we are over right now. We've been going for for quite some time, but if there's anything urgent. If not, remove your legacy hand. Um, if Henry and Gavin on there, and Peter. And mine is, I, I don't know if it falls into urgent, but it's a clarifying question. These um, planned small group sessions, um, I'm assuming we're doing those just like we do the larger Climate Action Council meetings and noticing to the public and, and doing a WebEx so the public can um, see the planned small group sessions, but is that not the case? I think um, we can take that back, but we had discussed it as being the same small group sessions as we had done for uh, the the scenario design discussions, um, and really intending to just have um, any basically just get feedback as as easily as we can, but certainly report on any feedback that was provided publicly at the subsequent um, public council meetings. Okay, and just for the record, I'm comfortable with these being public and, you know, when we're looking at the, the, the scoping plan itself, um, just think it's 
opportunity for the public to hear sort of even if in small groups deliberations around stuff and understand how we're we're sussing these these things out understood i think um one of our reasons for for taking this approach was that um you haven't seen a draft scoping plan yet and though we've been working on it there's like there's there's just so much there and so we want to make sure that um, what we're putting out for public consumption really is what the council feels is their plan and not a staff plan. And so because of that, we, we felt that it might um, be more helpful to have um, these smaller group sessions. But um, I appreciate your, um, your, your thoughts there. Thank you, Peter. And uh, this is Rose. I'm just going to pop in. Uh, Peter, I, I, I really agree with Sarah and the thinking. It it's, um, may not be our plan. Um, and so sometimes it's a good idea to have a discussion. It's just like you don't send every draft of every document to everyone. So I'm, I'm hoping that we do have the opportunity uh, just to take a look and then we will report back. And if everybody wants to see the original, they can as well. Yeah, I don't see anybody else there. Thank you, Rose, and thank you, Peter. <clears throat> Is there, um, Sarah, back to you on just the slide progression here? That we are at the end of the meeting. That's great. There's no fireworks or anything? That's it? <laughs> just ends like that? <laughs> You got them. It was earlier in the presentation. Carl. Yeah. It just ends in exhaustion, Basil. <laughs> was a great great job. Yeah. Good Lord. Thank you all. Thank you all for your attention. All right. Well, thanks everybody. We'll we'll see you uh shortly and we'll get back to you on some of those questions. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Bye. Bye.